Senate Chamber. Program signed. Welcome members to today's committee. Um, um, just in relation to uh, apologies, do we have these received? No. Nope. Okay. Um, today's meeting we have um, three items of business, which will be the departmental briefing on Brexit, the departmental briefing on road safety and driver and vehicle regulation, and the department briefing on transport policy and public transport. Um, just inform every, um, everyone who's in attendance, just anyone in the public gallery, that you can use mobile devices through a Wi-Fi connection, and all devices should be muted. Passwords details are available on the gallery rules for anyone wanting to connect to the Assembly's Wi-Fi network. 3G and 4G should not be used, and no recordings or photographs are to be taken um, during the committee meeting. Just to, with regards to chairperson's business, um, I received an email from a, a customer of Just Parks app, um, pointing out some of the shortcomings and in the incentive for, for using the app. Um, and also, members will be aware of the issues that have emerged around the Just Apps parking app and data breach that's come to light. Um, I understand that uh, a review of that contract has been taken place, um, through the department. However, it might be useful for members if we did schedule a briefing from officials on the Just Apps contract and any variance there is from the, the previous contract. So members are content that we do that. Yes, yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Um, also advised that I met with Belfast Chamber yesterday following an invitation through the committee. And we, we had a useful discussion um, and we also discussed the possibility of holding a meeting perhaps in Belfast City Centre um, and inviting maybe relevant stakeholders maybe doing a walk about just given the the issues in relation to, to the city, and it will obviously be very relevant to some of the work <coughs> the department is doing. Mr. Beggs. Um, we're, we're receiving a lot of individual uh, invitations. I think we should be having a, a sort of planning day and prioritising. In other words, we've been driven by what, who, who writes to us, and that may not be our best use of time, but I'm not ruling it out, but I just think we need to plan our use of time rather than just re respond to every letter that comes in. Well, no, that, that we are planning to do that in, in March, as you know, but I mean, part of all of these things will, will form part of our forward or programme and they'll be slotted in accordingly. Um, but there will be issues that will be topical that we will want to make ourselves aware of and keep abreast of if members are mindful of, of that as well. Okay. Yep. And then to our draft minutes at page five, draft minutes of the meeting of the 5th of February, 2020. <coughs> Agree with that. <coughs> Moving then to matters arising at page 11 uh, the, from the meeting of the 5th of February. Do members have any issues in relation to matters arising? Chair, could I just raise, because the, the, the method by which Rivers Agency um, have categorised lakes as reservoirs is, is causing huge problems within planning and, uh, and development and it's, I have made a few inquiries and I understand that they had no in-house expertise and someone came, uh, was brought in from England who did this um, analysis but I'm not sure of what level, if any, consultation there was. I know that my, one of my local councils has severe reservations by the method and the outcome and is opposed to uh, it's Lurgan Park Lake which some of you may know is the second largest it's, it, it was a cosmetic lake as part of the park uh, on the end of Ireland outside Phoenix Park and that's having huge problems so and, and then we, we didn't uh, and, and so you have Rivers Hitch doing that and then you have the, um, the department uh, which owns and has control over one side of that uh, boundary uh, hasn't as yet answered any questions in putting in place any remedial action to counteract the designation. So I would like to know how the how Rivers Agency how it came to to uh, to making those analysis and and what assessment and what consultation was used with stakeholders and uh, whether or not um, you know how robust. Uh, because we have local people who are experts and they would dispute uh, very easily 
uh, the conclusions made by the expert that was brought in by Rivers Agency? The members can send you right to the Department of Relations to that, although we do have um, a departmental briefing on Rivers coming well, up on the 26th of February. So perhaps if we send that to them and yes, they could address. Then they yes, that I'd be happy 26th. with that. Mm -hmm. Anything else from matters arising? Thank you. Moving then to correspondence, and draw your attention to correspondence at page 15. And this is from um, Mid Ulster District Council, which is offering um, to host a committee meeting in various council locations in the Mid Ulster area. And a list of the possible sites um, is attached. So, if members are content that we note this at this stage, and if we are making any visits in and around that area, that perhaps we could use one of those um, facilities. I'm sure Mr. Three. Allen yeah. could recommend yeah. one or two of them to us. Mark a few for you, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. At page 20, we have a copy of correspondence from Catalyst to the Minister for Infrastructure, congratulating her on her appointment and inviting the Minister to one of its workspaces in Belfast or Londonderry. So, again, yeah, members are content to note. At page 22, um, we have correspondence from the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. They are suggesting that the, um, that the committees, um, along with um, the Agriculture Committee, Economy Committee and ourselves, organise a joint visit to either or both Belfast or Larnports um, in relation to enhancing capacity and facilities to deal with the EU exit. Um, I'm happy to, to take comments or suggestions from members in relation to that. Sure, it was just to say, I suppose, if we're going to do um, Belfast and Larn, maybe to consider Warren Point as well, because I think there's, it's quite a key one in terms of um, the border and things as well like that. So if we are to consider that if the members feel that that would be useful. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a very good idea because there needs to be joint working <coughs> in relation to this. Um, as I said, it's around Warren Point. There's also the Befoil Port as well, so it's just basically <coughs> prioritising you know, the areas. But I think it's important that we work together with the other committee on this issue because it does require collaborative working in relation to this. Yeah. There will be issues involving containerised traffic, but I suspect the major pressure is in rural road traffic where you have time dependent loads, perhaps mm. um, food items, etc., which Delays will have a very critical effect, but also uh, uh, if there's delays actually in container traffic can be bad as well, but certainly <coughs> it could be quite critical in terms of rural road traffic where I think we should be concentrating uh, all ports that uh, uh, do facilitate significant rural road traffic. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm happy that we, that, we, that we visit all three. I'm also mindful that we do visits just to the committee on our own that we may not have enough people so the fact that there are three committees and it'll actually um, that, that will be useful just to have quite a number of, of interested um, voices around that um, those visits um, I also am mindful mind you that that takes three days out of our committee work and we may have a considerable <coughs> amount of um, legislation and so on and we'll also have other briefings that we'll want to receive so um, perhaps maybe Belfast might be one that we maybe want to do ourselves where we could have a committee meeting and a visit mm -hmm. um, and perhaps then look at, at Larne and Warren Point rather than taking three days out of our business yeah. Um, yeah. that we maybe just look at our diaries and, and our, and our forward work plan yeah. if you want to do that. The only thing I can like see possibly with joint visits is getting an agreed date that suits everybody. That's, that's true. That could, be different. that could be a challenge as well. So I think we're positive towards the idea of it, but we'll mm -hmm. really just work if um, staff practice. do that, sort of work out the logistics around that. Okay. okay. Sure. Mr. Oh, Boylan. Oh, sorry, I, I mean, we're going to have from March to December discuss this issue, and obviously the transport issues obviously is coming up in the debate now. It, it's going to be a key factor. I mean, it wouldn't do no harm actually to have meetings out on those locations over a period of time or yeah. put it down in a work program as opposed to just having one or two because I mean certainly in Warren Point as my colleagues mentioned, I mean you'd see directly there on the board there exactly what's it. so we tie in actually a committee day and do whatever need and, and any of those are even you went up to Larne. I mean, we've done that in the past, we went out to constituents <coughs> and tied in a committee day as well. And maybe as part of the committee program I certainly agree if we went into Belfast first. <coughs> we the two areas, and we could tie a committee day in as part of our. Which, like I say, we have a number of months to look at this issue, and we just need, you know, it's to be better informed exactly what's going to come down the tracks, you know. Okay. 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 Thank you. 
Okay, moving then to um, page 23 of correspondence from Pivotal. Um, again, Ashley Chairperson on her appointment, um, providing a copy of its first report moving forward, putting um, Northern Ireland on track for the future and requesting to brief the committee. Are members content mm. to, to note? Content. Okay. Page 23 is correspondence from the Committee for Finance, and that's regarding the Budget Bill 2020 and resource requirements. Um, obviously, there's a tight time scale, um, so we're really seeking the committee's agreement that we forward um, related information from the department and arm's length bodies to the committee for finance once we receive it. Okay, if you're content to do that. Great. Okay. Okay, moving then to item six, which is our first departmental briefing on exit, and just remind members that. Ansard will be recording. Information is up from page 54 onwards. And we will be welcoming um, Jackie Robinson, Director of Gateways and EU Relations, Jim Sutherland, Head of Brexit Planning Team, Donald Starrett, Head of Brexit Preparation Team, and Kieran Crosby, Head of Cross Policy. You're all very welcome to the committee this morning. Um, if you'd like to um, make an opening statement and members will follow up with some questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to come to speak to you today on the Brexit related issues facing the department. If you're content, I'll start by introducing the team here today and then we'll spend a few minutes giving an overview of the work that we have done and continue to do in relation to EU exit. Firstly, um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Jackie Robinson. I'm the Director of Gateways and EU Relations in the Department. Jim Sutherland heads up the EU Relations team and his focus is on Brexit and EU funding streams. Donald um, works on, in Safe and Sustainable Travel Division and his specific issue is in relation to Brexit legislation. Cairn Crosby is Head of Bus Policy. On Brexit, you will be aware that the NICS established central structures led by the head of the civil service to manage the implications of EU exit in Northern Ireland. DFI is an active participant at all levels. The minister is a member of the Brexit subcommittee of the executive. The permanent secretary is a member of the top level EU exit preparations and future relations project board. And officials at all levels are involved in the many cross departmental working groups established to consider specific issues. Internally, the department established robust EU exit project management structures with oversight by the Permanent Secretary. A central Brexit planning team was established to support the department's preparations with additional resource directed to those areas most significantly impacted. In preparing for EU withdrawal, the department's efforts have broadly and logically focused in two main areas. Firstly, working to assure a post-exit regulatory and legislative environment that will support the delivery of our services and statutory responsibilities. And secondly, by testing the resilience and efficiency of the infrastructure networks upon which all those services are delivered and on which our supply chains operate and depend. We have undertaken extensive engagement with stakeholders to communicate and, where necessary, advise on key issues and messages from government. This engagement has allowed us to fully understand the issues that are important to our stakeholders, and it has been a very positive engagement consolidating on existing relationships. As well as engaging with local stakeholders, officials engage with colleagues in London and in Ireland. Again, these built on well-established relationships. The environment in which DFI works is highly regulated transport, water, sewage and drainage. As a result, there has been extensive work in the area of legislation to ensure that it is fit for purpose to ensure continuity of service. I have mentioned water and drainage. We are aware that there were some concerns raised about the potential disruption to borders could impact on supply critical chemicals and spare parts required to treat drinking water and wastewater. The water industry as a whole, led by Water UK, has put in place a cross-sector programme to prepare for and manage any issues that may arise. This has allowed NI Water to enhance contingency arrangements to address specific NI issues, and we are hoping that that will not be a problem in the future. 
in relation to public transport. No major issues are expected during the transition period, but we will continue to work with counterparts in the Department for Transport during the negotiations for the future transport agreement with the EU. Again, for the haulage sector, there will be stability this year, but we recognise the need to consider a number of critical issues moving forward. These include identifying competent authorities and registrations. The Department has an established freight forum, which includes representatives from the local freight and logistics industry, as well as the PSNI. For drivers, the main issues are around licensing and insurance. During transition, there will be limited impact, but there will need to be some resolution for some practical issues. And importantly, we will need to ensure that we com effectively communicate with the public. You will be aware that the Department has regulatory responsibility in relation to some ports. Any changes to the current regime for checking or inspection at ports will obviously impact on them. It will be important that we have clarity soon to allow them to prepare. On EU funding, DFI has been very successful in the past in getting EU funding to support many transport and water-related projects. We have secured over 130 million of EU support through several different funding streams in the last 10 years. We are working with counterparts here and in the UK to explore every option available to continue this level of support. In particular, we are looking at the opportunities that may be available under Peace Plus. With the Prime Minister's deal and agreement on the withdrawal agreement legislation, the focus has now turned to the transition period and implementation of the agreement and the protocol. The robust management we have in place will, I believe, assist us through this stage in the process. Now, that has been very much a whistle-stop tour, but we're happy to take any questions that you have for us today, and if there are any issues that we can't address today, we will be happy to respond in writing later. Thank you very much, Jackie, for, for that presentation. At this stage, and I know that it's really early, and you, you've had I mean, a, a period of real uncertainty in relation to deal, no deal, and obviously the absence of an executive and minister in place. Um, but just as we're moving through this, this period now for transition, are you in a position to give the committee any idea about the, the type or the amount of legislation that we're likely to be looking at in the coming months? Yeah, it's, we are still looking at how the protocol and the withdrawal agreement bill will impact on the legislative needs within the department. One of the things that we are concerned around is in relation to the 2 2 powers from the European Communities Act. I'll maybe pass over to Donald for a bit more detail on that. Okay. Um, I suppose, by way of background, I think we've contributed to about 40 pieces of legislation over the last. Um, over the last year, I suppose, in uh, transport-related matters, there's a possibility that some of that may have to be tweaked now, depending on what, uh, how the negotiations go, and we are keeping an eye on that and working closely with DFT on that. Um, Jackie mentioned the, uh, the Section 2.2. Background to that is that a lot of our legislation, departmental legislation, particularly transport, has been created under the using powers under the European Communities Act, 1972, uh, and in particular Section 2.2 of that gives us a power to make legislation to implement our EU obligations. Uh, those powers will disappear. Uh, they remain during the transition period, but will disappear uh, at once that finishes and formal withdrawal. Um, we have a concern that there's a body of legislation there that once we lose that power, our ability to change that legislation, however we may want to change it in the future, may be compromised. So we've been working with DFT and we've been working with NIO and TEO uh, to try and understand, I suppose in one sense, we're not the only department affected by that, so we want to see if there's any wider plans to take powers, and if not, to take powers for ourselves. We'd be in the situation that if we have some of that legislation that needs changed and we've lost the Section 2.2 power and we haven't got anything else that allows us to amend it, our only recourse would be primary legislation, which is obviously uh, a longer route uh, and we may not always have that amount of time. So 
that's quite an important uh, thing that we're looking at going forward. And will that be regularised at Westminster? Uh, this is what we're not sure about. It's, it, there may be a possibility to do UK-wide legislation, or alternatively, there may be a possibility to do legislation through the Assembly or areas that are devolved. Um, um, the, have you been given any indications to how long that may take before you have clarity on that? We haven't. I've actually asked just last week again, and it, there just seems to be uncertainty about it. One of my concerns, one of the Department's concerns, would be that uh, we have used those powers so extensively, possibly more than DFT have, so we are continuing to press for something on that. Yeah, and what, what had DFT been doing if they hadn't been doing using those powers? They, um, what DFT had been looking at uh, from a transport perspective was uh, they, they were considering taking specific powers to allow them to change, uh, I suppose, uh, legislation and policy areas which they thought would be critical. And um, at the time, and that was just in the months before the Assembly returned, they were working with us to... Uh, in the event that they did take that legislation to give us the opportunity to, uh, for Northern Ireland to be part of it, to take the powers on a UK-wide basis. But then that, um, that work really was suspended at the time of the uh, Westminster elections and hasn't been resumed. Yeah. But, but I would give the, the committee some reassurance that we are on top of this. We, we are doing all the negotiations we can and keeping this very much at the forefront of our attention. So it will not be something that slips through the net in any way. So, uh, we, but at this stage, you're not in a position to give us any idea <coughs> about the type of um, legislative programme that we have, we have at, in front of us? Not, is, not is at this Brexit? stage in <coughs> relation to the 2-2 two -two powers, no. So we, we do have, uh, at the moment, with fortnightly uh, teleconferences with DFT, and are taking, uh, to the extent that they identify any issues there, where uh, that that gives us a, a little bit of a prompt. But we're obviously doing our own work as well. Okay, um, you've obviously s said that there won't be any. You don't expect any issues in relation to freight capacity and so on as well. Um, are there likely to be any anomalies in and around that? Perhaps if um, there are additional, there's additional freight coming from from the Irish Republic, for example, if they think that that's a better route. Or is that very much a, an, an internal issue for um, freight companies? Yeah, I think the freight um, capacity issue, and we're talking here specifically around ferries, um, um, is a commercial issue for the ferry companies. We have engaged extensively with them, and we are confident that there are no issues there. Um, we know that there are capacity issues on some sailing. So, for example, I think of it's, it's uh, the four o'clock in the morning sailing or whatever is, is normally full. Um, but that is not um, representative throughout the day. So there is capacity on other sailings and the ferry companies obviously have their own commercial interests and can put on additional boats or change the boats to larger boats should the need require. So as I say, we're confident that there are no ferry capacity issues in relation to that. And the only issue really you see then coming forward for ports and airports might be in relation to accommodate or compliance and inspection <coughs> uh, practices. Yes, and that would be very much an issue for um, whoever it is that undertakes those inspections. So inspections at ports could form, an, and we don't have a lot of clarity on this at the moment, but it could be um, a border force issue, it could be a customs issue. Both of those are reserved matters. It could be an SPS matter, which would be for the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to address in the first instance. Um, so, so we are aware that there may be some um, issues around that, once we get clarity, we will talk to the ports. And in fact, we have been engaging on a regular basis. It would be very few weeks where I haven't had a conversation with somebody in the ports. Um, and just in relation to infraction issues, obviously um, there's been a threat of infraction against EU directives in the past for a number of departments. Um, what's the status of that during this period? Um, and are, is the department aware of anything particularly around um, water or or any other directive that we may have been seen to, to breach or been alleged to have breached? Uh, yes, I mean during the transition period, we basically, in, in term, we're still 
uh, we're still subject to our EU obligations, so uh, we're still required to implement directives and regulations, and uh, were we to fail to do that, we're still open to infraction proceedings. Okay, and at this stage, we're not aware of any sort of looming? No, no. Okay. There, there, there are a couple of... Uh, there have been a couple of areas where we've had to... Uh, I think one example that occurs to me in driver's hours and tachographs, we had to make uh, a piece of legislation to uh, towards the end of the year, just before the uh, close of the year, to uh, make a piece of legislation to implement our EU obligations. And that was something that we, we initially thought we would have left the EU by that stage, uh, which was why the, uh, the amendment hadn't been made at that point in time. And when the uh, transition period was extended, we had to rush that through, but that's been completed, and again, we, we continue to look at it. Okay. Thank you. Mr Hildich? Thanks, Chair, and <coughs> Jackie, you're very welcome on your team this morning. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned maybe communication earlier. Communication is a big issue with the public, and no matter what government seems to do, there's always a, a cry of, we didn't know about this sort of thing. So are you confident that you can deal with the communication element of getting the message through to grassroots? Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly confident that we have a very good system of stakeholder engagements. Um, be before I came to this department, I worked in the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Um, and I always believed that information that the department gave out wasn't necessarily as well listened to as it was whenever the messages came from those key major stakeholder groups. So we are working quite hard, and a lot of the, the information that we're giving out to the likes of the freight industry <coughs> will go through their bodies as well. So we have multiple channels to get out to the public. Um, I think we're in a very good place. We had very good communication strategy in the run-up to a potential no deal, um, and those will continue, not only for this department, but at an NICS level. Um, and I trust that the committee will help us as we go forward with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, just on your pri priority one issues and, and some of the qualified solutions developed, there, there's some sort of bread and butter issues there which affects potential local local constituents, which you would deal with on a weekly basis in relation to the implications for blue badges, for instance, for taxi operators and for penalty charge notices, etc. and whatnot. How, how far have those issues been developed? Um, Donald, would you be in a position to... Respond on those? No, not on, not on those specific issues, unfortunately. Well, what we'll um, do, if you don't mind, is take that away, and we'll come back to you. That, that would be good. Thank you. Appreciate that. And just following up on the ports <coughs> issue, you're, you're indicating there's no expectations of the freight capacity. There are been issues on the GB to Northern Ireland ferry routes, but you're, you're saying that with a degree of confidence, obviously. But what sort of capacity does it actually sit at? I think the capacity, I'm, I'm going to say off the top of my head, it was about 60%, but I could be... Roughly. <clears throat> the conversations that we've had with both Stena Line and p and have given us you know, sufficient confidence that the routes themselves overall are running at about 50 to 60% capacity. So there's a lot of headroom on the routes themselves. Jackie made the point about the timings. In some cases, some of the, the ferries are busier than others. But overall, on the routes themselves, there is you know, significant headroom for any, any uh, increased flow of traffic. And that includes both freight and roll-on, roll-off situations, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a number of points to make. Okay. Uh, you don't mind, Chair. I mean, we've now moved from a, being a s small region in a member state to I don't know who's going to do what. Uh, I appreciate the protocols and we've been through it. Um, but significantly, obviously, business and in particular the transport, in, which is the big part of this committee and responsibility that we have, um, have a number of issues. And there's the East West issue, which is grand, and members have mentioned the issue of the ports. There's also the north-south issue in terms of, of how we manage that. But, Anna, I'll go to yourself because you're the legislative man. See, in terms of we had a foothold in terms of when we were implementing a European laws in terms mm -hmm. of directives. Yes. How now are we going to ensure that um, we protect those directives? Because surely we, we've signed up to a load of them down through the years here as part of the committees here in this assembly. Um, nobody knows what West, Westminster is going to go on this. 
I mean, is there any guarantees we, we will be able to protect and use those, those EU regulations, like the ones that protect the, the transport in the at the minute? Okay. The, just to pick up on the, the EU regulations, those, those have been part of our work was, and uh, this was really led by DFT, but was to make the necessary changes to those regulations so that they would function following withdrawal. So those have been changed and have been brought across <coughs> into UK law and uh, Northern Ireland law. So as things stand, those will continue to function immediately after withdrawal. Um, in terms of in terms of moving forward, uh, obviously there are areas that the department will uh, be bound by the, the protocol. So where there are new directives, new regulations coming in, there will be an obligation on the department to uh, to implement those changes. Uh, that's specifically in areas where um, the protocol requires us to do it, and the withdrawal agreement act gives powers to uh, both to Westminster and to, to devolved authorities to make changes uh, to existing legislation where they're required to um, comply with the protocol. Beyond that, where, and, and this is maybe where the, the Section 2.2 issue potentially kicks in, where there are uh, changes that need to be made that aren't necessarily mandated by the protocol, but where uh, there's a need to, to change, say, to comply with new EU legislation where we decide we want to do that, mm -hmm. um, then it, it'll be a matter of checking our existing powers to see if we have any powers to implement those directives and regulations. If we haven't, that's where the Section 2.2 gap potentially emerges. Uh, so, so that's where our work has been to try and identify specifically where those gaps are and close them if we can, because if we can't close them, the alternative is primary legislation. And, and that's where I see the problems. I mean, it's not just, see, in terms of like, the emission testing, the vehicle operator and license, you don't see a problem with that at the minute? At, at the minute, I think we, what we have to yeah. do is work through what the, the outworkings of the protocol is going to be and yeah. how the implementation of that. No, no I appreciate it. I, I agree. I understand that. But the point is, I mean, I've been engaged with the industry, and, and basically, it's down to nuts and bolts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are the questions we get, and I appreciate all that. And we, as we go on forward, but but I'm just trying to get a feeling for it because I'm mindful of what we're saying about primary legislation here. Mm -hmm. It's okay if we adopt what's there and it's agreed, but if Westminster go and do their own thing, we still then might have to look at what we need to do. So, so I would just reiterate something I said to the chair earlier. Um, Officials advise and ministers decide, and this will be something that our minister will decide in due course um, as, as we go through post-implementation period, the transition period, um, and, and will decide what, if any, legislation we take on board from the EU, which would be outside the protocol. Um, we will make those decisions <coughs> um, in consultation with her at that case, and I think today it would be unfair of us to start to go into those policy issues. Oh, no, 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 I appreciate it, uh, but I'm, I'm mindful of on the scrutiny committee, and we're, we're putting these forward now, because <coughs> the next question is, um, I know that there's a, there's a Braggs and Joint Committee set up through the executive. Um, for those people who need to engage, i.e. the industry itself, because they'll use partly this committee and ourselves and each <coughs> MLA, those are the things we need to be asking now. My question is, how do those people engage with the process? Because at the end of the day, we're finding out exactly what they're being hit with, and their contribution will play a part either in legislation or agreement with what's coming forward from Westminster. Yeah. And we will, we will happily take that evidence, whether that comes through yourselves, and we will be very happy to take any evidence that comes through you, or for, through our own stakeholder engagement. Um, we will take that on board and put it into the evidence portfolio for the Minister to decide. So, Jackie, you said you have already had a number of engagements, so mm -hmm. none of this early discussions in terms of shipping back and forward and, and the potential problems mm -hmm. that lay uh, between North and South, and none of that discussion has taken place. In relation to emissions, I'm not aware of any discussions around emission tests. Or any, um, any other matter at the minute? No. Okay. Um, just, just in terms, obviously, then some of the stuff you mentioned, operation, the waterways, iron, that north-south stuff. You've, it's early days in terms of what 
So, yeah, um, I also have a sponsorship role um, for Waterways Ireland. That's part of my remit. Um, and I have been working with Waterways Ireland on um, a regular basis to go through the processes. The, the most significant issue, I think, for them will be in relation to data sharing, because they have employees on both sides of the border. Um, at the moment, they have sought legal advice, and they are very comfortable in the position that they're in, and that, that will not be um, an issue for them going forward. Um, I, I know Waterways Ireland are coming in to give you evidence in a couple of weeks themselves, and they'll be able to, to clarify that. But at the moment, there are no significant issues in relation to withdrawal. Sorry. And finally, Chair, because I realise it's early days, but I mean, some of us have had discussions on how it's going to impact an industry. We've been dealing with businesses, especially on the board. Um, uh, just up front, Donald, at the minute, in terms of um, the business of ICE sitting out there as a, a transport operator, at the minute we're aligned with EU regulations. At mm -hmm. the minute we don't know exactly what's going to come down the tracks. So you're saying we will engage, obviously, with DFT. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure the EFT will be engaged in what happens over in England and Scotland. Um, it may not be best for what's here because, like I say, we have we've east west, but we also north south links. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the kind of reassurance we need to give the business. We have from now, from March to December, um, and these discussions will take take off very shortly. And, and mm -hmm. we just we appreciate the presentation today, but. Those are the kind of things that's coming at us now. So yes. appreciate, appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Uh, and thank you again for, for the presentation. It's, and if I cover anything, that's maybe already yes, apologise. But I suppose I have a couple of questions just around um, import tariffs and, and if we have any indication of what the extent of the alignment will be in terms of import tariffs for vehicle imports from the EU. Um, and Will they apply equally to northern import ports from the EU um, in line with Britain? No. Okay. So <coughs> tariffs will be an issue for Treasury to deal with, okay. and it wouldn't be within the competence of DFI, so we'd rather not go into that space. Okay, well, that's fair enough, that's grand. Um, and the other one, I suppose, and it's something that um, has been raised with me as well recently in terms of um, migrant workers and, and around um, the issues in what's a plethora of stuff there but um you know what will be i suppose going forward for skilled and skilled workers from the eu working here in the north um you know is there any indication of what way things are gonna again uh, um border force issue mm -hmm. um so I'd, I'd like not to go into that space okay. um i think probably for this um debate maybe concentrate on the infrastructure issues okay if we can that's fair enough okay thank you Sure, just on the point, I, I, I appreciate the answer, but, but a lot of those people work, and they're part of the labour market and work within these structures. I mean, our duty obviously is to look at infrastructure in totality, which is the transport industry, and that's why those questions have been asked. Because, yeah. and we, we made a, obviously, the last day we, we, um, we talked about taking presentations. The lead committee, and this is, we, we instructed the lead committee with somebody else in this, was it economy or something? Make that indication. Because the infrastructure is a big part to play, <coughs> and that's why that question is asked about skilled workforce because they play a big part in the infrastructure <coughs> in the transport, yeah. which is our. Yeah, and, and, and I do appreciate that, and I appreciate the overlap. Yeah. But you know, going down to the fundamental policy, it would not be a policy that sits within this department. But I do, I do take your point yeah. that it affects our stakeholders. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Cheers. Um, Mr. Beggs. Yeah. yeah, thanks for your presentation. You, you'd mentioned that there might be a need for primary legislation because of loss of powers, and obviously it takes time to introduce primary legislation. When's your call date so that we don't get caught out for not having started the process of introducing primary legislation if there is uncertainty? When, when do you need to make that call? So, so as Donald has already said, we are um, engaging at lots of levels in relation to the legislation. Um, we've already engaged um, with Westminster, we've engaged with TEO and um, the Departmental Solicitor's Office. So we think that there will be a solution to this, hopefully in the fairly short term and within a space which will allow any um, legislation to be taken through the process. Then, in terms of the, certainly there's going to be a regulatory border down the RIC, if not um, tariff inspections, etc. And in terms of that, additional space will be required in our ports. Um, what assessment has been made 
if there is sufficient capacity uh, at our ports, or is it going to be in Scotland and England, or is it going to be in Northern Ireland? What assessment has been made of that? I think it's fair to say that there's still a degree of uncertainty about what checks, if any, there will be at ports, whether that's here or in GB. Um, I, I mentioned earlier about who carries out the regulatory inspections. From an SPS, it's live animals, food and, and um, products of animal origin. It will be the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. In relation to immigration, it will be the Home Office. And in relation to customs, it would be um, HMRC. Um, so it will be up to them to make an assessment of what space they would require at ports and to facilitate that. Um, our um, impact in relation to ports is really in relation to the regulatory stuff. So what, what a port does is up to the port business largely. Um, and I'm assuming that there will be um, ongoing engagement when we get to a place where we know what, if any, checks are required. Okay. Maybe I could possibly add yeah, to that, sure. Jackie. Uh, the department themselves have, we've been involved with uh, Amphreys and Galloway uh, local uh, enterprise partnership to discuss freight issues with them. Obviously, you know, we're keen to understand the impacts in Carnarvon and uh, Belfast and how those, those would impact. Those were, were very informative from our point of view. Uh, in terms of physical restrictions in and around ports, the only indications that we have from any of our conversations with the ports at this point in time is that perhaps Warren Point would be the only port in Northern Ireland that could have difficulties in terms of expanding physically. Uh, certainly, uh, Belfast and, and Larne have indicated that they are capable of, you know, uh, having sufficient space to allow. Uh, facilities to be developed there. Not the case in Carn Ryan, uh, and we've been talking with uh, Transport Scotland, uh, Dumfries and Galloway Council, and uh, Police Scotland to, to discuss the alternatives that they have, and they're certainly moving forward in terms of creating uh, contingency <coughs> plans for stacking and storage of uh, vehicles on the Scottish side of the, the crossing. Okay. In, in terms of um, the briefing you've given us, um, it's also been indicated that there um, could be areas where there needs to be bilateral agreements um, with the Republic of Ireland. Uh, now, is that between the Republic of Ireland and the UK, or between the Republic and Ireland of Ireland and the Northern Ireland Executive? Um, in relation to specifically, just uh, and, and the briefing that we've the briefing that we've been given. Um, Negotiations between the UK and the EU identified a number of areas of North South cooperation where bilateral agreements between the UK and Ireland may be required post Brexit. Okay. I think that would score, <coughs> it would be international relations, and as such, it's an accepted matter, so it would be between the UK and Ireland. Okay. And the other area which I, I, I really don't quite understand how it's going to work and how, uh, what role we will have, if any. The, the uh, new arrangements talk of uh, a specialist committee and joint committee to uh, decide issues. What comes to the assembly and what goes to them? This will be again in relation to how the, the outworkings of the protocol work. Um, at the moment, I'm not sure just exactly how that's going to work. Um, so a lot, a lot of the changes we may not be involved in or have any say in, is that what you're saying? Um, I don't think that will be a case. It, it's more about advising. Um, so, for example, those committees will look at risk assessments in relation to any <coughs> checking which may happen, um, and they will look at the outworkings of the protocol and how that's actually operationalised. Okay, so it's really... Are you saying there's really a fog at this minute and stage? Um, nobody knows what's coming forward. At the minute, I, d I don't have clarity. Um, I'm not saying there's a fog. I'm just saying that at, at this stage, I don't personally have clarity on how that's going to, to work in practice. And, and would you accept that, um, in terms of the industry, the most important thing is, is that uh, there are not undue delays at our ports, uh, that goods, perishable goods in particular, do, do not suffer uh, and be a cost um, to, to industry. Um, and as such, how are uh, those concerns of delays of port being taken on board? 
So again, I refer back to um, DERA and their, um, their responsibility in relation to SPS checks. Um, we will be looking at that. At the moment, there is still not clarity on what, if any, checks will be required. Once that clarity is obtained, then we will be able to start working more with the ports um, to look at any <coughs> infrastructure requirements they need or anything else that they need to support them in order to, um, to go through with that. Um, but it will be largely for DERA to look at those fresh food imports and those just-in-time deliveries. Uh, I know it was previously two and a half million pounds was allocated to uh, trust ports, mm -hmm. but none to the port of Larne. What, what was that money spent on? So um, th there was a competition. I, I, I just f for a point of clarity, that money was not given just to trust ports. That was a competition to look. Um, th there, there was a sum of money, and we allowed the ports to bid for it. Um, Larne Port was was eligible to bid in that process, so it was not curtailed to trust ports. I just want to make that very clear. Um, it, we did get several um, applications which more than took up the money that we had available. It was in order, initially, whenever we started and we went through and launched that scheme, it was to allow the ports to prepare for a no-deal scenario and to give them a bit of resilience to look at future planning and increasing their business in a post-exit um, environment. Um, in between actually launching the competition and getting the applications in DSS, we had a deal on the table. So when we did that, we looked at the applications in relation to no deal preparedness, but also how it would impact in a deal scenario. And as a result of that process, three ports were successful and a total of just under 2.5 million um, pounds in funding was given to the three. What, 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 what was delivered from the 2.5 million? So, what, what so that work is due? still ongoing. They, they haven't quite delivered on that. They're due to deliver um, within the next couple of weeks, literally. Um, and what is being done is um, additional <coughs> infrastructure or capacity to allow for areas where lorries, for example, could be parked or where checking could be carried out. So it's, it's additional space. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Kelly. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. <coughs> Could I just pick up on the driver's issue that's contained within your briefing and under the legislative issues, the train driver licensing? I have, uh, like I'm sure many others, many haulage companies in my constituency, and I heard what you said that some of this might be an issue for the uh, border police, etc. But nonetheless, over the last two years, with the whole Brexit debate, many of our local companies are finding it very difficult to recruit because many foreign nationals have been employed in that sector. So have you heard this issue being raised within your stakeholder engagement? And whilst it's not an issue for your department itself, have you then, because people think when they're talking to government, they're talking to government, mm -hmm. have you communicated those issues with your colleagues in the economy? So, so um, just, just for myself and a wee bit of clarity, are you talking about the licensing issues? or are you talking about an immigration issue? I'm talking about the, the, uh, the fact that uh, the workforce is diminishing. So there has to be uh, some sort of focus by government uh, in terms of enabling uh, people to get their licence, of, of looking at where the shortages are, of hearing from the companies yeah. that some of them don't have enough staff. So uh, whilst some part of that might not be your responsibility, it is... the the responsibility of another arm of government. Yeah. So, so um, I want to know that you're not working in silos. We're definitely not working in silos. And those, as I said, whenever I was making my opening remarks, officials within this department have worked in a number of cross-departmental groups. So we work very closely with the Department of Economy, for example, and those issues would have been raised there. Um, I think one of the issues, maybe <coughs> specifically, is around mutual recognition um, of qualifications. And that is something which is very much up front and centre um, in our thinking going forward and how we're going to deal with that. But I think that my point is to you, but how are you communicating that message to give comfort to the haulage companies? Um, we, we are working with the haulage companies. Um, we are trying to engage as much as we can with them. In relation to the mutual recognition of qualifications, we haven't got to a point where we have a decision or we know how that's going to work. Um, and I think it would be wrong of us in the position where we don't have clarity to try and give clarity or, um, to somebody else. Um, so it's, it's just, as the transition period continues, 
we will, as we know more, engage totally with them. Well, I'm sure the haulage companies will be happy for an honest approach to be taken. If you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. You don't, uh... and, we do, and we do have that freight group, um, which mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, so that they will be well aware of the issues and the work that we're doing. And through that, we're also well aware of the issues that they have, and, and we're taking those on board. Okay, and then, Chair, in relation to the um, very wicked attempt on the 31st of January to attach, uh, uh, or to actually did attach a bomb to a trailer, how, uh, what impact is that having on security, and what discussions is the department having with uh, the, those agencies? including the PSNI and Border or Port Police, or whatever they are, Harbour Police? I, well, as I said in my opening remarks, officials at all levels are involved in a series of cross-departmental working, and I personally am involved in a work stream which includes security. So I work closely with the Department of Justice. We have the PSNI and Border Force also represented on that. So I'm confident. I, I don't think it's, it's right in this forum to, to go into details no, on that. Asking. But I am confident that, that we <coughs> are on top of the potential issues that well, uh, that's good to hear. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Warren, did you have? Just to be point, Chair, because I, I don't know where Hansard is going to be able to record this or not, but it's, it's, this is where we find the difficulty. We're getting a brief, and we have a responsibility for infrastructure. I'm tied up in all our past comments in terms of the labour force, and what I'm saying, and I appreciate that there's been joint cooperation, it, it seems to me, in some, but it looks as if there's silos there, and that's why I was asking you when we made a decision a couple of weeks ago, so. because we need to coordinate all this here. But the most important thing is, so the industries are getting their input into all this, but most of the questions we are today trying to direct is get answers for <coughs> the constituents out there who have been engaging with us on, on all part. And I appreciate it's early days, but we've only got nine months to get this right. So what I'm saying, Chair, in effect, what I'm trying to explain is we need to coordinate all this together, all the departments, and I appreciate whose responsibility it is. We need to feed in and all of that. Mm -hmm. Because we're getting it, we're getting the overall picture. And to us and to the people out there it's not saying which department is responsible. They just want answers. That's, That's all. Right. And I'm just putting that on top of I very much accept what you're yeah. saying, but to be fair to officials. Oh no, no, I pre pre appreciate working now in the I, last I, three no. years in a very difficult situation. Oh no, no, no I, I, I understand either, and, and, at the and, same time. I, I appreciate and, and constituents have been likewise asking us questions for three years. Do you understand me? I appreciate we'll work together do, collectively. Do totally. Yeah. And if there are any issues yeah, that you're getting raised no. by stakeholders, uh, feel free, you know, um you, you can contact me at any time and I'll take on board. No, no, appreciate you, but the point I'm making it's about yeah, government yeah, working yeah, together and us collectively yeah, and not yeah. picking on any single individual. Well, there's a certain amount of information that they can share with us at this stage, which yeah, is yeah, in their own confidence. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, but I suppose we will return to this again yeah, yeah, the Brexit yeah, subcommittee, problem. which has been established. Yeah, no doubt there'll be, there'll, be, there'll, be, there'll be further engagement as well. But there's a certain onus on all of us too, because we haven't been in the position. No, 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 no I, I appreciate you. I'm just, I'm, so just, I'm just flagging that up in the early days. So we're, we're, I, I okay, think I maybe if... if you know, I, I, I would like to, to maybe try and give you a little assurance in, in relation to this. Obviously, over the course of uh, the uh, withdrawal negotiations, over a three-year period, the structures that were put in place matured and were actually very effective. There was a lot of work streams, cross-departmental work streams, that this department sat on, including the trade-related issues, uh, the mobility issues, uh, movement of people and goods, all of those discussions we were part of, we weren't necessarily, necessarily leading those, but we had the opportunity to feed into those. We used our stakeholder involvement to try and make sure they, that the issues we were hearing were finding their way into the central discussions. I think that's, we're not at that stage in terms of moving into the transition phase. The structures that we have in place aren't necessarily mature at this point in time. I think they'll get there. But a good starting point for this is the establishment of the Executive's Brexit subcommittee. And I think that could be a potentially very, very you know, effective uh, structure to allow those kind of conversations to make sure that they're, they're actually being centralised and considered holistically. appreciate it. It's just we're in the middle of it all, but I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just picking up on the previous point from Mrs Kelly around security, and to thank the officials for all the work that's been done in relation mm -hmm. to that. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and do you know that there's quite a lot of cross-departmental working in relation to that, and I think it's important we continue that um, to secure the safety of, of everyone. Um, just in relation to, within the briefing, it referred to 
ports and airports, and that said there is recognition that the Department may face demands for involvement in some aspects of physical infrastructure planning, so it is around infrastructure. Um, there are elements which will relate to the Department of Infrastructure around that, but also in relation to, to DERA and stuff that they are going to do. Um, I just want to sort of get an update really in terms of how that sort of inter, interdepartmental work is occurring with DERA and how they are progressing in terms of their work in relation to that, in terms of how you are interacting with that, because there is quite a lot of crossover in relation to that infrastructure that would be in the port. Yeah. So in relation to the responsibility of this department, it is yeah. largely around the regulatory aspects yes. of the ports. In relation to the infrastructure, um, I am aware that there had been some very early work done, and I am going back to my time in agriculture, so um, that this is not an update position no. by any manner or means, um, where there was some um, thought given to what that infrastructure could look like yeah. if we needed it. But again, I would go back to the point that at the moment there is lack of clarity around what, if any, um, checks there would be needed. Um, we are working quite closely with agriculture, and obviously, because it was my former department, I have very good contacts there, and we work very closely. Um, we're also working, um, as Jim has said, through the executive subcommittee and through all the other structures that are available to us. And my colleagues in Dero would be, you know, so for example, every Friday morning we have a, a senior users group meeting, okay. and Dero would be represented. So I'm there, economy are represented, um, Department of Agriculture are represented. So, so we have very good joined at working, yeah. and we're all aware of where we're at. Um, there is some issues around um, just what <coughs> that infrastructure and how it might be facilitated going forward. Um, but we still need some legal clarity on that. Okay, so it's about sort of legislation to facilitate it, or is it about place, you know, sort of areas to put it, or it, it really around the responsibilities <coughs> in relation to that, the, the legal responsibilities for different departments or different okay. parts of government. And they're trying to get clarity on that yeah. at the moment. Okay, I think that's quite important. I just think time scales in here. You know, where there's lack of clarity here, but the clock's ticking down. No, and, I am uh, very conscious of that. Yes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so the long time. there's going to be an element of contingencies and you know, and all the rest of it around that. You know, so I think it's important we continue this engagement. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. so yeah. Thank you for coming along. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you. I suppose I'm conscious of uh, got over our own ground, but my colleague or uh, the member referred to the, the fog lifting. I suppose it's a bit about the point of haulage and drivers going north south, and a. Uh, not that saying one's more important than the other. When do you see that fog lifting and a little bit of clarity for those drivers, you know, coming to the end of the transition period? When do you see clarity for whether it's a family going down for a day trip in a car, whether it be insurance, as you refer to here, or licensing, or the haulage? When do you see that fog lifting that there's going to be some clarity goes out to those sectors or individuals? Well, the, we're, <coughs> we know that the negotiations on the protocol and the withdrawal negotiations are due to start very soon, within the next couple of weeks. Mm. So I would say that that will start to lift, um, and we will start to get a bit more clarity. Um, the outworkings of that may take some time. Um, in relation to the likes of insurance, I think we already have a fair bit of clarity around it. <coughs> yeah. and, and yes, in terms of the motor insurance, at the moment <coughs> we're working on the basis that uh, green cards will be needed. Uh, the green cards basically evidence that you have appropriate insurance mm -hmm. cover. Mm -hmm. The UK has applied for membership of the Green Card Free Circulation Zone. Uh, we get that it's effectively business as usual. You don't need to do anything that you, you don't need to carry a green card. Uh, we are waiting on uh, that being ratified or implemented by the EU Commission. Still hopeful that will happen. Even if it doesn't, the green card is the uh, carrying the green card is the uh, contingency option. Mm -hmm. Um, so there, there should be no difficulty, motor insurance-wise. Uh, we're not anticipating any problems there. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you, um, and thank you very much um, for, for coming, and meeting with us this morning. Um, I suppose the key from all of this is there's a lack of clarity, um, and I suppose it will be useful for you to come back um, in the not too distant future. I suppose just to give us an update on, on where you are, particularly in relation to to the legislation, because I think that would be useful for us, um, particularly whenever we're, we're planning ahead what we want, we, we wish to do as a committee. Um, we'll be happy to do that. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you.
actions that you wish to take as well as from that briefing? Just to keep a watch on it and, and schedule another briefing. Sure, just in, in, in terms of ourselves, committee, um, obviously, a numbers, like I said, the numbers have been engaged with stakeholders. Uh, just need a. Can we do anything about that or what's the process for them? Can we write the department to see how they can feed into that or the whole process? See, the whole. The, 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 the protocol is not grand, that's all right, that's sorted out, so whatever the department, the department have their job to do in terms of whether we need legislation or the continuation, not about doing to us as an assembly. But the other side of that then is how those stakeholders out there engage in this process, because lots of them are asking about licensing, emission days, uh, license, uh, driving across the border, the question about the green card was mentioned already, <coughs> a number of questions being asked. and. It's just how we get that, close that gap. Is it to come to us or how to redirect them? Or that sort, that's the conversation. Clearly, there are no answers at the moment. Oh, no, absolutely. Those questions, and, so and it's not as if we're holding back information. No, no, I know like the is, yeah. officials aren't holding back information from us either. So I suppose maybe if you want to write to um, the department, it just ask to be kept up to date because there are a number of issues which have absolutely. arisen out of this committee session that we would like to see and hear answers. Fair enough. Yeah, um, yeah fair enough. I'm sure there had been uh, some questions asked and along those type of issues where they, they had said they would come back once for that. That's about yes. priority yes. one. So. so maybe we could follow up on that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but ask to be kept um, informed. Yeah. Thank you. We'll move on to our, our next briefing, which is the road safety and driver and vehicle regulation. Um, again, Hansard will be recording and information is in your packs from page 60 onwards. And we have with us Alex Boyle, who's head of Vehicle Policy Branch. Um, we'll have, we will have <laughs> Beverly um, Cowan, who is head of Driving um, Policy Branch. Donald Starrett, head of Brexit Preparation Team. Uh, he's back again. <laughs> he, hasn't, he hasn't had enough of us. Linda Hurley, who's head of promotion and outreach branch. Um, thank you very much. You're all very welcome uh, to committee this morning. Would you, would one of you, wish to make an opening statement? I will, Chair, if that's okay. Yes, well, to you this um, time. Just basically, I suppose, to set the scene, our director, Chris Hughes, isn't able to be with us today. So. The four of us basically are hopefully covering all your questions, if we can. I'll maybe start just by giving a very brief overview of the division, and after that, we're happy to take any questions. Um, there may be issues that we're not able to cover today, and uh, we'll come back to you in writing. So, uh, our title then is Safe and Accessible Travel Division, and I think committee already have a short paper that uh, gives us an overview. I won't go through that in any detail now, but the paper shows really the, the key areas that we have. So, uh, with road safety, vehicle policy, driving policy, road user behaviour, and then freight and bus policy. Uh, and we also licence and regulate uh, heavy goods vehicles through the, uh, our transport regulation unit. And as well as that, and we've touched on that uh, in the last session, we had a small unit within the team that looked specifically at our EU exit legislation, uh, and I headed that team up. Um, so say we've covered some of that work already. I suppose the other thing maybe just worth emphasising is that we do have a, a unit that deals speci specifically with road safety, within the covers uh, that area. But road safety really runs through everything that we do. Uh, so we're, we're looking to have safe vehicles, we're looking to have well-trained drivers, an effective <coughs> regulatory framework and <coughs> policies which promote care on the roads and uh, responsible road users, so road safety really runs throughout the division. I know as well that the Minister has spoken with the committee about departmental priorities and some of those do relate directly to areas within our remit, so for example, Ministers announced her intention to bring forward legislation on e-bikes, and she's spoken about her concern uh, about the spike in drink driving detections over the Christmas period. 
and she's indicated that she sought a meeting with the, the Chief Constable and uh, to consider what can be done. So both of those issues would fall within our remit. That's really all I have to say at the outset, so we're happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, and there's obviously a, a very live issue today in relation to um, the fact that we have 43 people in Northern Ireland who have over 12 points on their licence and they still have their licence, with yes. one individual having over 21 points on their licence. And I suppose really m most of us would assume that once you get to 12 points that you perhaps shouldn't have your licence maybe even not even just as high as that you shouldn't have your license can i have any comment from you today just in relation to that particular story well chair we're aware of the story and the um as you know the legislation uh, provides that 12 points normally leads to automatic disqualification however there is discretion in there for the courts so the courts can take account of mitigating circumstances in individual cases now, uh, that, I assume, is the reason why those drivers are on the roads. It, it wouldn't be possible for us to comment uh, on any of those issues because it's really down to uh, the discretion of the judiciary. And I, and I do appreciate that, but you do have a remit for road safety. And yeah. the indication would be that if someone has an excess of 12 points on their licence, that perhaps they aren't safe to be on the road. <coughs> I understand that, and I say that, that that's why automatic dis uh, disqualification is provided for in our legislation, and that's the case, I should say, UK-wide. Um, but also UK-wide, there is this discretion for the courts. Um, it's really not possible for us to, to say what's taken into account in individual uh, circumstances. I do appreciate uh, it, uh, it sounds a high figure. But I don't know the circumstances. Well, can you give us an idea of what exceptional circumstances may be? Unfortunately, we can't either because there's actually no guidelines laid down that I'm aware of uh, for, for what a court will take into consideration. Um, so we don't, we're not really aware of that. It would be, I'm not sure whether the Department of Justice would be able to provide more clarity on that, but it's not really something that that we are aware of and conscious. Uh, as you say, yes, we have responsibility for road safety and it does seem to be an issue for concern, but without knowing the, the specific circumstances, we can't really comment. Okay. Now, you, you obviously have a road safety strategy that expires in December 2020, and I understand that you're in the early stages of developing that. Will we have the launch of a of its of the of a new road safety strategy um, as the as this current one expires or will we have to wait some time for that um, the current position is as you say we're in very very early stages of gathering some information on what um, the possible options are for replacement of the current strategy when it expires <coughs> minister is aware that we're at that early stage and Minister has said that she wants to be as informed as possible before she makes a decision on the way forward following the expiry of the current strategy. She's also said that she expects to be in a position to make that decision later in the year. So at this point in time, we've had no further conversations with them in and around the strategy. Okay, so we may be in a, in a situation where we may not have a strategy for a period of time? Um, I couldn't you can't comment, <coughs> comment on that. At this on stage. that. Um, okay. We would expect that we would be able to give Mr. all the available information so that she can make a decision on the road. Okay. Uh, I suppose we, we all understand that uh, as drivers, and I guess I'm most around the table are our drivers, that whenever we get behind the wheel of a car, that we have a responsibility <coughs> to make sure that our car is roadworthy, that we are in a condition that we can, that we can drive. Um, but we're also mindful of the fact that um, the people are irresponsible. Um, you, they don't take in consideration other road users, be that pedestrians, cyclists, or, or other drivers. And certainly speed is a factor in all of that. And there have been calls, and I know guessing colleagues have all asked for the reduction of speed limits on various roads around their own constituencies. What discussion have, has the department had in relation to um, lowering speed limits, particularly on on B roads um, and other rural roads um, where there are a number of fatalities? 
Our division wouldn't deal specifically with that, Chair, uh, with the lowering of speed limits. I'm aware that there's been uh, um, conversations, particularly around schools, uh, about lowering the speed limit. Uh, and I do appreciate what you're saying, but at the same time, with your remit of road safety, yes. it's very much tied in with, with speed as well. Yes. There are a number of pilot schemes going on within the department. I am aware of that. And there is um, a school of thought that that does help improve safety around roads. But what I would say is, in relation to speed, it isn't exactly the speed limits themselves that pose the problem in a lot of occasions. A lot of occasions, it is the fact that those drivers do not reduce their speed in accordance with the conditions of the roads. Mm -hmm. Speed limits themselves are a maximum that you can drive on any particular <coughs> road, but there will be circumstances and weather conditions and other things that may mean that you should reduce below that speed limit. And quite often, whenever there is a road traffic collision involving a serious injury or a fatality, it is around excessive speed for the conditions, as well as those who are willing to exceed the speed limits as they are set. And I accept that. But again, going back to the point that in the drafting of any road safety strategy, um, is there consideration given to perhaps the need to reduce the advised speed limit on particular roads? What I would say in relation to the strategy again is that we will be speaking to all stakeholders in relation to what the options are for going into any successor to the current strategy and whatever it, people like engineers, the road design people will also be involved in that. Road safety stakeholder groups will be involved in giving us information that allows us to inform the, inf uh, the minister as to the possible options. And I would not rule out or rule in reduction of speed limits. It would be in the mix along with everything else, but we couldn't prejudge what would go into the strategy. Thank you, Mr. Pex. Okay. Um, in your briefing, briefing regarding heavy goods vehicles licensing and regulating, you've indicated that you're in difficulties in curtailing or removing licenses for non-compliance of the operators, uh, <coughs> and you're experiencing a backlog. How big a backlog is it? How, how, how long? How lengthy? How lengthy it is? How many people are involved? I think there's there's something like in terms of the uh, public inquiries. I think that the figure I'm aware of is something like 50, 52. How many HGVs would this involve then, with all these different operators? I wouldn't have figured. Now I understand the question, but I wouldn't have figured how many uh, HGVs that equates to. And what reasons would these you be seeking to remove operator licences? Can you give me examples of the sort of reasons? I believe given you concern that these people are not fit to operate heavy goods vehicles? Well, I suppose in giving <coughs> licences in the first place, uh, there's a requirement for good repute, for sound financial standing, uh, that sort of thing. If there's reason to believe that that's in question, uh, that's where, uh, well, I suppose investigations would start and possibly culminating in a, in a public inquiry. It's probably worth saying as well that although the public inquiry themselves ha uh, haven't been active for uh, longer than we would like, but there still has been other activity going on in terms of the issuing of licence <coughs> and even the, the suspension of licences. There has been uh, other activity, but it's the public inquiry uh, aspect that hasn't. In, I'm assuming some of the reasons might be failure to maintain vehicles that required standards. So there could be road safety implications yes. for this. Yeah. Uh, heavy goods vehicles are frequently used to transport stolen goods. So there could be people that are not trustworthy or that yeah. have come in contact with the law. Uh, and of course, we're aware through the media mm -hmm. that uh, some uh, unscrupulous uh, drivers and operators have been involved in people's trafficking. So even people's lives are yeah. being put at risk. So I'm really shocked to see that one of the reasons that you haven't been able to do this is a lack of a venue. Can you explain what venue, what do you need? I don't have detail on this, but I do know that's one of the issues. Uh, there's, there have been resourcing issues as well. Um, the, 
I think, I think the question around the venue is that, that certain facilities are needed. It's not, it, that's not the sole reason that there haven't been public inquiries. There are other more fundamental reasons. There's, we, at the moment, are trying to ensure that we have uh, appropriately trained staff because staff have to conduct the public inquiries, and before <coughs> they're allowed to do that, they have to be quite extensive training, so we're trying to get that sorted. We are working through the problems, but uh, I say it's um, maybe not as quick as we, we would like, but we will be engaging with the Minister. And, and I suppose I should say as well that we haven't had an opportunity to discuss these issues in detail with the Minister yet. You've indicated your, your um, staffing, resourcing <coughs> and training issues, um, but would you accept that uh, failure to actually uh, require good standards of all operators means that uh, there is unfair advantage being given to those who are not complying against operators who are uh, ensuring their vehicles are roadworthy and brought up to a good standard. Uh, so you're actually advantaging those who, who do not comply by not enforcing it. Um, and indeed, uh, additional costs will fall on other departments if, for instance, someone is involved in illegal activity. Police may be having to spend large resources trying to track uh, vehicles down instead of the operator just being taken off the road? Yes. I think we have to accept those points. Uh, the public inquiries are there for a reason, uh, and it's why the department is uh, trying as hard as we can to work back to a situation where we can clear the backlog and stop one developing in the future. Madam Chair, I think we should be pressing this issue with the Minister, uh, because it's, I don't think it's acceptable. Okay. Um Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Yeah, just uh, my colleague to my right here seems to have stolen my thunder on this one. Yeah. Anyway. Just, just on that, it'd be good to get a bit of clarity on a few specific questions. And just was that a specific question for you? You referred to fifty odd operators. Yes. Is that right. Yeah. So uh, that operator, I presume, still has technically a license. Yes, to the best of my knowledge, yes. So, is there any issue? So, if he or she is still a license, he or she is still insured to be on the road. Yes. No, 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 query on that. I, I don't think so. I have to, I have to say, uh, and I meant, as I mentioned at the beginning, we don't have anyone with us today that's specialised in that area. But, but I am happy to come back yeah. uh, if, if there's a question well, there. I'm happy it, to come it, back. It, in it that. might be useful actually yeah. if, if that could be arranged for a member of that unit actually to come to yeah. the committee just to go yeah. through those issues, just to give members some sort of clarity. Uh, on numbers, etc. Yeah. Of vehicles, and uh, that's what we're talking about on the road, etc. So it's a range of questions. We could dig out of that, but there's no point in <coughs> going any further today if you're happy. And, and the other issue there is, that, as we said earlier, we need a, a discussion with the minister on this too. You know, but uh, once once that happens, and um, we have the the minister's mind on this, it'll be easier to come back at that stage. Any not, other questions? Thank you, Sorry. Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Welcome back, Donald. <laughs> uh, Road safety, again, probably in declaring interest as the chairman of the Carrick Fergus Road Safety Committee, and I know Mr. Beggs is there as well on it. Uh, there used to be road safety committees across the whole of the province, uh, way before even the review or the organisation of local government. And I know ourselves in Carrick, we kept it on despite it being dropped on a province wide basis, and that's run by basically volunteers now. And people who would be sort of playing a lone furrow in the field of road safety at a local level. Uh, though I have to say the support from the department locally has been very good and we've got a 20 mile an hour, for instance, on the model school at the Belfast Road. There's issues over lineage and, and signage and all that sort of thing. So there's a good working relationship there and I can see the real benefits of the localised uh, road safety committees. Uh, so if you're, if you're looking to have a, a, a new strategy in place, would the department consider, uh, I know it was maybe a different department before that, but would the, would the department consider including the re-establishment potentially moving forward of those localised with the local knowledge on road safety issues? Because they do work with primary schools at a very early age in relation to you know annual poster competitions, quizzes and all this sort of thing. That still goes on in my area, but it's driven by that committee. It, there's no government input to that sort of thing. So it's support for those people as well. Yeah. I am aware of some of the background around this and, and the reasons why funding was removed from the committees in the first place. And it was uh, a previous minister of the, 
former Department of Environment, Environment who yeah. made that decision and the funding was removed. Um, uh, you now work under the banner of Road Safe NI, or you work with Road Safe NI, and I also, in my role as I'm Road Safety Behavioural Change, so I'm responsible for activities that actually influence people to have better behaviours when they're using the roads. Well, then they would have to say why we're supposed to. I can't think. I can't remember the last time we heard from Road Safety NI, to be honest, you know. So. All right, OK. Well, I mean, I have worked with Road Safety NI, and I do mm. cooperate with them, so I, I thought he was working with the majority of um, Road Safety so perhaps not. It would be a question for the Minister um, if the Road Safety Committees were to be re-established and I presume funded through the Department, so that I think would be something that the Minister would have to address, not <coughs> officials within the Department. It was a ministerial decision to take away the funding in the first instance based on certain reports, etc., that were done, um, and it would obviously then be a ministerial decision should <coughs> funding be re-established. So yeah. really, I wouldn't be in a position to answer any more <coughs> that. Okay. But I do agree that there is some very good work done at local levels yeah, through yeah, committees so. and through voluntary groups. It's all voluntary at the yeah. end of the day. You know, so. yeah. Uh, the, the, the Radar Centre, uh, I know, I'm not sure you are a sponsor of it as such, but uh, what's your assessment of the work that they do with young drivers? And obviously, there's a threat there as well. Um, yeah, I mean, again, radar. I have been involved in the radar project as a representative of the former DOE and also for the Department for Infrastructure. Um, and so far, I've been involved right from the get-go when it was established and the difficulties they've had with funding, etc. I think it's an extremely good tool and a supporting role for activities that <coughs> other organisations are doing with regard to road safety. And so for their, the former DOE did support it, did fund it with a capital injection initially of £125,000, I think, was paid at that stage. And it was the actual... <clears throat> excuse me, driving simulator that was purchased with that money, which obviously targets young drivers. Mm. Um, and then the department was also supposed to fund the project. It was a pilot for three years or on after. But it took some time for the Radar Centre to get established, and by which times uh, public sector funding had been squeezed considerably, the minister at that time, felt that funding radar was not one of their priorities, given the fact that um, there were budgetary constraints. <coughs> the PSNI then agreed <coughs> to fund the centre to get the centre up and running, and that was, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was 2016, January 2016. Mm. It was supposed to be for the initial year only. Radar has continued to struggle to get funding, and PS and I have funded right up until their own budgetary difficulties meant that they had to withdraw funding, and they closed in December 2020. But as a tool to support other activities, it has been something that's used to embed knowledge that is gained elsewhere in yeah. road safety terms. And every little activity that happens in regard to road safety is something that helps improve the position. But nobody ever knows what one thing makes that difference. It's the collective um, actions of the many that make the difference. Yeah. I just raise these issues in relation to your uh, work coming up on, on a new strategy, and then hopefully maybe some of those will resonate at home with the department. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you um, for for the report at the start. I suppose, and I appreciate you've said there that uh, speed reduction and that is not within your remit. But as as Mr. Heldich has said there, about in terms of recommendations for the new strategy, um, and the chair has touched on it as well, particularly around. Um, schools, roads where there's schools, and my own constituency, I can think of one example in particular where there's, it's rural roads and their national speed limit, and I mean it's, it is a death trap, it really, really is very, very 
very dangerous. I've had officials out, and I appreciate that in terms of traffic camming and all of that, they're very, they're very limited in what they can do because of the speed limit. I've also had PSNI out, you know, in terms of managing, you know, any any road users or whatever. But within, because if, if, as you said, if they're not, if they're within the speed limit. There's very little they can do, and it is down to to um, the, the motorists themselves. But you know, going forward, I am very aware of the pilot program, and I've engaged um, with it would have been Simon Richardson would have been in the Southern Division about um, the potential for rolling out the 20 mile per hour to all schools. So going forward, and I know this is a question for the minister, and I you know will will be taking this up as well with her directly. But within the recommendations, is it possible to? To put that forward, that that may be something we should be looking at in terms of outside schools reducing the speed limit to 20 miles an hour. Everything is possible within the recommendations, but as I say, it's such an early stage. Mm -hmm. it, I wouldn't be in a position to second guess what might go in any briefing that the minister would be given. What I would say is, it is very clear when a road traffic collision happens and speeds involved, that the outcome is more likely to be a serious injury or a fatality. The other thing, mindful, is if we're talking about driver themselves, the lack of wearing seatbelts <coughs> means that a fatality or serious injury is more likely. But when it comes to an area where we're talking about children, children are a very vulnerable road user. And if they come into contact with a moving vehicle, obviously the outcome of that is likely to be more serious. So the lower the speed a collision happens, the greater the chance somebody surviving that collision is. There's no doubt, no doubt about that. That's what the evidence suggests. Yeah, and I suppose just on that point, like the example that I'm thinking of is a very rural school, and they use um, the field adjacent for their brakes and things like that. So they're crossing very young children crossing with obviously supervision um frequently throughout the day and it was actually raised in their inspection report that this is an issue um and unfortunately when i contacted the department there was nothing that they could do at that time and um, there is signage and things like that warning drivers but we felt and the school felt and i suppose some of the parents that reducing the limit too would give other bodies more power <coughs> To try and take action so that's only one example and I, i'm sure a lot of the members here would be able to give others but for that to me that's a critical one yeah. um, and that's why i think in any strategy going forward it needs to be a key issue and something that we look at because you know one of the other schools we have recently got this the, it reduced but it was 40 mile an hour and you know it was a quite a good road it's not very rural but quite a good road and i can tell you that a lot of the drivers are doing that and more. So, um, I think that you know it's something that needs to be looked at kind of holistically and yeah. and with all all agencies. Yeah. When it comes to road safety, one of the the key issues is road user behaviour. Yeah. Um, because when we look at the statistics for road traffic collisions where somebody's killed or seriously injured, nine out of ten are in fact averages more than nine out of ten are down to human error so that means somebody has made an erroneous decision somewhere it could be something as deliberate as getting in behind the wheel of a car after having alcohol it could be as deliberate as speeding breaking speed limits or not paying attention to um, the conditions or it could be attention diverted, and that, there's many things mm -hmm. fall into that, including the use of mobile phones, changing radios, um, and so forth. So there are a lot of things that fall into that category, but <coughs> we can have great engineering, we can have the best routes in the world, but it's human behaviour is usually at the core of those collisions. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr Boylan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your presentation. And just listen to Mr. Hildridge. I remember the time when the money was actually taken off the groups, and there was a number of them with road safety at that time. Um, and I'd like to expand the outputs. I, I see it a bigger issue, and, and the chairs alluded to it, and, and my colleague as well, um, as part of the road safety strategy. We should look at some of the traffic camera measures, because I mean, people have mentioned schools and. For the benefit of those people who don't, who would never have heard of these schools, yeah. Foley School in Ballymacnab and St John's Eglish in the small townland of Titarn, which is close to Annachmore, have been fighting hard for for those things for years. The budget had been cut, and 
uh, as part of the overall strategy and as part of the overall budget, because the budget was cut for the traffic common schemes. And like members are talking about the, the, the way they work with kids and going to schools and everything else, I'm sure if a child came out and seen a physical structure outside the school, would get a better understanding of what that structure is about, as opposed to people coming in teaching them. So I mentioned that context, and I mean, I would hope that after the discussions today that you would go back and, and look at those issues, because that's part and parcel of it. I recognise that, and sadly, up until the fourth there, there was nine people who have died on the roads, and I mean, um, compared to six last year. And we've seen, it's all factual evidence, and you know, we're reacting to things as well, but we need to be proactive. So as part of the strategy, we would appreciate you take yeah. some of that stuff back. Um, when we're looking at what possibly could inform the successor to the current strategy, we will be talking to the road engineers, we will be talking to the planners, we will be talking to enforcement, um, the ambulance service, the fire and rescue service, all of which have an input into the current road safety strategy and are all key players going forward and improving road safety, as well as engaging with stakeholders who all have an interest in road safety. So I would expect engineering yes. interactions to be in, in there in the strategy. I would expect behavioural change um, actions to be in the strategy. I would expect um, enforcement because unless we're addressing what we call the three E's that affect road safety, engineering, enforcement and education, those are the keys to improving road safety. <coughs> so whatever form the successor to the strategy takes, it would have to be including those types of areas. But the decision would be with ministers what she wants that to look like. Yeah, well, I make a play for the engineer's solution, go to the top end of the list, OK? <laughs> Just a couple of other things in, in terms of, and uh, just trying to think, you know, I don't know what you've seen in some of the central reservations, there does be wire ropes instead of barriers along some of the roads. And some of the, obviously the road segment fraternity have mentioned that to me. I mean, that's, that can be quite dangerous. Just I want, to, I want to note that there's some of them, there's definitely some of the roads with, that there's wire ropes instead of a barrier. And, and um, maybe take that on board. And the issue also of quads and helmets. It seems strange to me that and I'm from a rural area and I know I know in the mid some farmers here, it seems strange that you have to put a helmet on crossing the road which may be twenty foot wide from one field to the other. Now I I brought this up at a previous meeting. Would there not be some consideration to given that the helmet will not be worn all the time? I realise the issue of legislation and whose responsibility it is, but as part of the conversation in, in road safety strategy. I don't think it's a difficult one because that means those using the quad put on the helmet, throw it off in the field, put it back on, drive across the road and back and forward. This needs to be a bit of common sense in relation to that. And, and also in terms of the, um, because we are a legislative body, some of the things that members have mentioned and ready in terms of, because I've had numbers of meetings, as all the members have, out on the road about speed limits. And we can't do this on eight class roads, and we can't do that. Ultimately, the safety feature is the most important thing. And I mean, my colleagues mentioned some of the schools. I know some of the roads myself, and some of the some of the villages that are main arterial routes, legacy routes. Has been, and they can't get traffic cam. So the, the issue too, we, we need to look at that as well. Um, and turn just one other point in terms of back to the road freight, the freight policy, Donald. See, in terms of the um, the branch also contributes to the development of UK-wide policy and legislation to ensure <coughs> that it's fit for purpose. How does that now tie in terms of, of the Brexit? Happening, or is that still just to play? We still would continue to, uh, to tie in, certainly, with DFT. There's regular engagement with DFT, and uh, I would expect that to step up, actually, over the next few months. So, and it's just part of the policies you have here. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you. Um, just a couple of members have obviously mentioned reductions in um, funding, and be that even for road safety committees or, or other aspects. Can I just ask what your current budget is for road safety? Um, for 
Road safety behavioural change. My current budget would be 700k in the current financial year. It was 700 for the 18, 19 year, which is a 30% reduction on the previous year when the budget was 30% 30%. reduction on the previous year when it was 1 million. Having said that, you know, there are budgetary constraints across everywhere in our department and other departments, um, but that's the current position. Um, against mitigating against that reduction, we have looked at some of the campaigns that we are on TV. We have <coughs> reduced them in length. Um, so that we can still get the maximum number of campaigns out for the money that's available. Okay, so that, that was the immediate um, consequence of the reduction, was actually just the, with the length? Yeah, it was. Um, a, a, lot, a lot of those campaigns m may have been sort of 50, 60 seconds long, and they may have had... Um, certain music as a baseline on it, which really did help emphasise the message that was in it. We did reduce the campaigns to some of them are 30 seconds, some are 40, and we have removed that music that was behind them and put some library music, which doesn't cost the same amount of money to our, but the messages are still there, the core messages of those campaigns are still there. Okay, and um, was there a reduction before the, before you got to the million as well? You know. Yes, there was. I mean, o over over the years, um, the, the budget has fluctuated um, considerably. The maximum budget that we ever received was almost three million, um, and that was in two thousand and thirteen, and that sort of coincided with probably the lowest. Um, road deaths that we had on record in 2012, but they started to rise again um, in 2013. Reach, and in 2012, they were 48 people died on our roads. We started to see a gradual change then in 2013, and in 2014, they'd raised to 79. But since 2015, we've seen a steady reduction, and down to 200, in 2018, it was 55 people died. Mm. At the end of 2019, 56 people died because one person died sort of within the three month period after the road traffic collision and accounted in the 2019 statistics. So we are on a downward trend, although obviously it's not ideal that anybody loses their life. That's a considerable budget. Reduction from three million down to seven hundred. Yeah, three million was the highest it has ever been. It normally was in and around um, high, one point five to two million, but three million was the highest it ever was. It has never been that high in quite considerable time. Certainly not in my time in road safety. Okay, and for this budget round, um, what um, we haven't had the information on the budget line but my understanding it is in around the same or similar amount as it has been this financially okay thank you um miss kelly thank you chair thanks for your presentation it probably come as no surprise i want to pick up on some of the road safety as well because a large number of the fatalities are on rural roads and I do know that a lot of it is around driver behaviour and the use of mobile phones. I know that that has been the case over the past two years in my own constituency. Um, and whilst we talk about the number of fatalities, there's also about seriously injured, yes. and we don't have those figures. So I just wonder, uh, because the police tell me that the specification of vehicles now is so high that actually it has greatly contributed as well as seatbelt use to the reduction number of deaths. But in terms of serious injuries is another matter entirely. Yeah, um, they didn't start keeping statistics for serious injuries until 2000, or 1971, 2071, 1971, and since then there have been almost 80,000 serious injuries at that time. Along with fatalities, over the past number of years, we are seeing a downward trend okay. in serious injuries. Now, we did see a period of time where we saw a spike 
and the de Gaulle, they had been on a continuous downward trend until 2009. Um, and we saw a spike in 2016, but we now see those serious injuries reducing again, but they haven't yet got back to the low figure of 2009. But all of um, the indications are that they are continuing to go the right way. There's always a three-month lag at the end of the year for uh, serious injuries, and that is simply because if someone dies within that three-month period, unfortunately, they convert from a serious mm -hmm. to a fatality. So for there, we would expect the figures for the serious injuries to come out um, by the end of March <coughs> and of April. And, and those will be shared? The, the, yes, they're, they're always shared. They're always published, and then they're all also available on the PSNI website. Okay. Um, Chair, the, um, the insurance companies, have they not uh, an obligation, never mind um, an interest, in making a contribution to road safety mm -hmm. campaigns? And, if, if, and, and do they? In the past, when we made a road safety campaign, we tended to be quite successful in getting some sponsorship from the insurance industry. Um, the last one um, I'm aware of that sponsored a road safety campaign was AXA. And then we also had a campaign that was sponsored by MIS, MIS Claims. That's like mm. um, a recovery mm -hmm. um, group. But in recent years, we have ha found it very difficult to get insurance companies to sponsor the campaigns. And, and the bottom line on that tends to be that they want a payback for their sponsorship. They want a guarantee of airtime and how, lo how frequently the campaigns are going to be on TV. And what dividend there's going to be for them because if they sponsor that will go on to the mm. end mm. of the campaign sponsored by XR and mm -hmm. you know they would have the name of the sponsorship so that gets them PR so they they are probably doing it more from the point of view it raises their profile in that they are connected with government's advertising on road safety so in the past number of years when we have gone out and commissioned new campaigns and tried to get sponsorship from insurance companies, we have been unsuccessful. Um, but there's no legal obligation on them to contribute. It's usually because they understand that they will get some um, form of payback out of it. And was there any impediment to, to working in partnership uh, from the department in doing that? And, and, and allowing their brand, if you like, to be part of the ad campaign? Uh, no, in the fa uh, from the point of view that they had no input into the campaigns at all. The campaigns are always made in advance and only when they are completed is sponsorship sought, so they have no influence on what the campaign says. The only benefit that they get is it does raise their profile with potential insurers. Sorry, and if, well, sorry yeah. I would just like to clarify, we don't pick an insurance company to approach. We go out to the whole yeah, industry no, yeah. and invite them to mm -hmm. apply for sponsorship. And, and is that done year on year? It is only done um, when we make a campaign that we think um, an insurance company may be interested in. The last time we, we did a campaign where an insurance company would be interested in is our campaign, um, Mobile Shame, and that was about driving. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we got a few insurance companies interested, but when it came down to the actual sponsorship, none of them seemed mm. to agree. There's no legal nor moral obligation yeah. would appear. And it's unfortunate mm. because that sponsorship then can be fed into 
um, our time and enable us to put the campaigns on more frequently. There might be something might want to look at a bit more with insurance companies, but can, can I then ask, yeah, put under the, the section implications of the budget about, um, because it, it's around enforcement, there are... I mean, uh, I find it where there are street lights, for example, there actually is a 40 mile speed limit unless there's a derogation from that from the department. I found that out uh, recently. Not many people know that. Maybe we'll need to refresh it. At least didn't even know it actually when I had the, the site thought, meeting. Okay. So, uh, in terms of enforcement, it says about on the ground enforcement by both police and DVA. So, what enforcement does DVA? It's more do? to do with the, the heavy vehicles. Um, as opposed to um, the normal motorists, it's, it's about transports of goods, mm -hmm. etc. Okay, and then can I just pick up one? There's been a number of accidents involving farm vehicles, particularly tractors, and I just I mean, I'm not, it not, might not be popular, but the, the, the size and scale of farm vehicles nowadays compared to a number of years ago when you had the open. <laughs> You know, giving ages away here about open cabs and all the rest of it, but uh, is there going to be any review of the licensing requirements in terms of policy for farm vehicles and the age of users? Because there were some tragedies, I think, recently involving quite young drivers. Um, no, not that I'm aware of. Um, that certainly no intention at the moment to have a review, obviously. Uh, DVA colleagues would continually look at, at um, and would recommend to us on the policy side that perhaps this is something we, we need to consider. Um, and I do take your point. Um, some of the tractors now that are using our roads are substantial. Gigantic, gigantic. They take up the whole say road. say the least. Um, <laughs> um, of course, if they're used on the public road, they have to comply with the the correct um, requirements around things like lighting, braking and so on. So they they are, if you like, within a, a legal framework. No, I understand um, that, that, yeah. that they, they must obviously um, it's it's a bit like quads and um, uh, if they're just used on, on farm private land then you know it's at the discretion of the owner as to High road where they are otherwise the the vehicles are, mm -hmm. um, but certainly you know we we continually look to see what we might need to do, and a lot of the regulation around those heavy tractors uh, derive from EU regulation. Uh, obviously, that's going to change. You know, I know you've had a session on Brexit earlier, so mm -hmm. that's obviously going to change as we go forward. So all I could say is that certainly it's something that um, you know. If required, um, we would be seeking the minister's um, view on on any alterations that that um, may come forward. Uh, well, well, just from personal experience, chair, you know some of the tractors and then carrying another piece of machinery behind. Some of them, you know, are going at 50, 60 miles, and yet I know others. Accidents have occurred because the tractor was driving so slow, and somebody's trying to overtake. So, in terms of the analysis and the findings of the accidents over the last uh, term of the strategy, I'm asking, would there be some um, discussion between uh, what's the current situation uh, in terms of farm vehicles plus uh, the road the policy, you know, mate? Well, I think as, as Linda has said about the strategy, obviously, you know, there's nothing ruled out or, or ruled in mm -hmm. because it is a review of the, or coming to the end of the, the current 10-year strategy, obviously. That's something that we would be considered, and there are many groups out there will undoubtedly come forward with ideas and suggestions as to what a future strategy should look at. In turn, that's something that our, uh, our minister would consider uh, in due course. Well, the, um, uh, can I then move? I might not be the right official, so but about the bus policy and bus licensing uh, uh, for operators, do, do you, any of you? Areas of responsibility around that. Mm, the part, no, we, it's not an area that um, 
Yeah. No one sitting here is directly None of us deal directly dealing with it at, at, at the moment. But the next brief. Again, the next brief. that's okay. I can save it for later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, ju just chair. I mean, I recognise that road safety is very much a partnership around education and police and all sorts of. And I would hope that there's collaboration because when you look at the number of deaths and, and serious injuries, it, it should concern us all and does. Well, that's one of the key things that Minister has said. She's keen to work with partners in improving road safety. Um, okay, thank you. Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just for the record, um, sorry, to Claire, I was briefly employee of TransLink. I'm also a councillor in Arjun North Downborough Council. It's like a broken record in that one. Uh, the, uh, just in relation to this, um, see, in relation to the fatalities, you know, there's personal stories behind yes. every single person in relation to that, and I think it's important that we, we recognise that. And the work that's being done, and you talked about sort of the, you know, the sort of enforcement, en engineering, and education, and they're they're fundamental. And I think if, if there's going to be a new strategy, engaging with all the different partners, whether statutory or non-statutory, is essential. Mm -hmm. And I just get an outline in terms of the time scale for that, because you know, obviously, the strategy, current strategy, expires at the end of this year, and. I think it's important that the time is spent working with all those different bodies to engage with them, because that's the only way the strategy is going to be effective in the context of the budgetary situation that you've outlined. I mean, I wouldn't be in a position to give a timeline because the conversation has not yet been held with the conversation. Um, the minister would be the one that would make it on the way forward. And in the previous strategy, what was the consultation and engagement? Uh, previous strategy was post 10 years ago, so I'm not really familiar about the detail of the length of time that that took. Okay. I think it's important the Minister also comes forward with sort of what is the plan here in relation to this, you know, because time's not on our side in this regard. Okay. Thank you. Any other member wish to any further questions? Beverly, you had a very easy time. I did have an easy ride today, definitely. <laughs> and Alex, <laughs> as well. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I just noticed a couple of things really coming from that, in that we ask, obviously, for a representative then to come up from the Transport Regulations Unit to brief the committee, and also in relation to the issue of, of penalty points. That we need to make contact with justice. So if we write to the yeah. committee in the first um, instance, directing our comments in towards the, the, the justice minister, just to, to get clarification around um, the issue of not having automatic disqualification at 12 points, and obviously around the exceptional hardship and um, circumstances um, point that was being made. So our members can tell with that. Is there anything further that you'd like to follow up from <coughs> that session? Okay. Move then to our, our final briefing for today. Which they say they've been put down to the council session and in years ago. I'm not, sh I'm not sure. Did she, did she suggest that she was going to come back in relation to the previous strategy in the no, constitution? Yes, no. She didn't. Okay. Okay. We need to find out, you know, from the minister what their plans are on this. Yeah. That, that's something that we can certainly follow up. Yeah, chair, I, I would support that because yeah. I think we need to expand the strategy. Out. I mean, yes. because I know they can't come back, then they need to go to the minister. And some of the suggestions we made here, I would like them to take seriously. Yeah. And try and incorporate it into. It's, you know. it's clearly, this is a ten-year strategy, which is coming to an end at the end of this year, and then we start to yeah. yeah. work on it now. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Apologies. Moving on then to our, our final briefing, which is transport policy and public transport. Again, Transstar will report the meeting. Information is from page 66 onwards. And we will welcome Liz Loughran, Director of Transport Policy, and Tom Reid, Director of Public Transport. And we have an apology, I think, then from Orla Campbell, Head of Accessible and Community Transport, to attend, so she'll not be here today. Um, Tom and Liz, you're very welcome to the committee. Um, would you like to make an opening statement and then we'll follow up with some questions? Yep, it's fine, thanks, Chair. I'll, make, um, I'll give you a brief overview of Transport Policy Division and then how. how, how yeah. 
then give Tom a chance to talk about Public Transport Division as well. So, I mean, briefly, um, Transport Policy Division breaks down into three main areas, and it's covered in the briefing that you've been given. So, I'm the PFG coordinator for the department. So, whilst the department's permanent secretary is the outcome owner for outcome 11 in the current draft of PFG, which is the connect people um, and opportunities through our infrastructure, um, we also make quite a significant contribution against some of the other outcomes, particularly outcomes two and outcomes four, so the health outcomes and the environmental outcomes. So my role is to coordinate efforts across the department, really looking for ways that we can make further contributions in terms of PFG, so as I say, not just outcome 11, but the other outcomes, um, and also to seek opportunities for collaboration, so to look for ways that we can work in partnership and look for other stakeholders um, where hopefully if we work together Together, we'll maximise our PFG um, efforts. Um, the second part then of the division is really transport planning. So at the moment, we're working on four transport plans. So they're intended to set out the framework for transport policy investment decisions up to about 2035. Um, the four of them are the Belfast Metropolitan Area Plan, the Northwest Transport Plan, the Sub-Regional Transport Plan, and the Regional Strategic Transport Network Plan. So the, of those, the first one um, for completion is going to be the Regional Strategic plan. Um, so that um, is, we're at the stage with that where we're, re we're um, bringing, um, we're having discussions with the Minister about what her priorities are and what direction she wants to go with on that. Um, the other three plans, um, we they really have a two-stage approach. This is the first time we've done transport planning um, in light of the new um, local development planning system. So as we've now got the two-stage local development plan, um, equally we have a two-stage transport plan to go with that um, and to align with that. So the first stage, the one that we're working on at the moment for those three plans is really just the evidence base. So that's um, what we will provide to the councils so that they can work through that um, for their um, plan strategy stage. Once that's done and they um, start to move into um, the detailed local policies planning stage, that's when we'll look at um, a detailed transport plan to sort that. It's an iterative process, it's something we've not worked through before, so it's very much a case of feeling our way through that at the moment. Um, the third part then of the division really is climate change um, coordinator for the department. And this is very much a new role. Um, I am now acting as convener um, for all the activity across the department, although I have a particular focus on the transport side. Um, it's really about trying to bring together our mitigation and adaptation work, and particularly um, looking for further mitigation opportunities. Um, the department um, had done a lot of work previously on adaptation, so for example, looking at how we make our bridges and our roads um, better into, um, as the climate changes and how we make things more resilient. Um, given that transport is such a contributor to greenhouse gases, we're looking to see how, what more we can do on the mitigation side and put a lot more focus on that. Um, clearly, work very, very closely with DEER on that, both the climate change and also the air quality issues um, related to transport. Um, also, um, we've been working recently with DFE on the energy strategy, so they have just gone out with a call for evidence to underpin the new energy strategy. There will be transport workshops as part of that, which we will lead. So that's a very kind of brief overview on my side, and I, what I was trying to say before, I will hand over to Tom. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. I mean, firstly, thank you, Chair, for the, the opportunity, obviously, to come along today and provide an overview on the work in the Public Transport uh, Division within the Department. Now, the, the Public Transport Division it plays a key role in the oversight and development of public transport in Northern Ireland, and that's very much in line with the Minister's priorities. So it's Minister's wider priorities in terms of regional connectivity, 
growth, uh, connecting people, and not very much that focus on place and people. And we work very, very closely with Liz's team and other teams across the department because the issues you're dealing with aren't just in terms of the investment in public transport. They're much wider than that, and we, we can come back to that. The, the briefing papers it sets out, we are responsible for the sponsorship of the Northern Ireland Transport Holding Company, and that includes the department's public service agreement with TransInc and the provision of capital and revenue grant to TransInc. Now, the Minister highlighted previously the, the challenges. Obviously, the, the reductions in the Department's budgets in 2015 uh, presented in that regard, and you'll be familiar with those issues through the, the first day brief uh, material. Now, while we work closely with Transing a role in the division, it is much wider than a sponsorship function. It's about the development of the wider public transport network with Transing at its core. And it is very much about support and delivery of the Minister's ambitions and programme for government outcomes, which Liz has set out. And those aren't just restricted to the programme for government outcome and connectivity. It cuts, it cuts across sorry, the entire range of outcomes. Very difficult to see one of those in which public transport doesn't have a role to play. The, so reflecting that, we are also responsible for the administration of the commercial bus permit system. And that aims to enable commercial operators to offer services which are distinct from those provided by TransLink. Obviously, that includes the likes of tours, sightseeing operation, but it also allows private operators to offer services where there are gaps in the network or which could complement the network operated by TransLink. In addition, the division leads on strategy and policy on inclusive or accessible transport and community transport. That includes our sponsorship role of MTAC, that's the Inclusive Mobility Transport Advisory Committee management of the concessionary fare scheme and delivery of grant funding for specialist transport through disability action transport and the community transport partnerships. And finally, we also manage the Rathlin Island sorry, Perry contract uh, under that team. Now, uh, as a briefing paper sets out, the, we take that work forward through four branches within the division itself. The TransLink Sponsorship Unit is the sponsorship branch or sponsor branch for TransLink, and that provides resource and capital funding annually, approximately £180 million, uh, to support and improve public transport. And as part of that, the unit works very closely with TransLink on the delivery of capital projects. That includes uh, the likes of the Northwest Multimodal Hub and the Belfast Transport Hub uh, flagship project. The unit also has responsibility for monitoring TransLink performance against key indicators in line with the public service agreement. Now, the current public service agreement with TransLink came into effect, I think it was March 2016, and that was following commencement of the public uh, passenger transport and apologies, services agreements and service permits regulations, Northern Ireland 2015, which aimed to address the requirements of EU Regulation 1370, and the Transport Act 2011, which critically requires that TransLink deliver the majority of public transport services in Northern Ireland. Now, the current PSA is a five-year PSA. There was an option to extend that by year, and that option was taken up. Uh, so that has been extended to 31st, 31st sorry, of March 2022. Uh, and that was to allow for negotiation of a new service agreement and return of ministers. And that work has been led by the Public Service Agreement and EU Exit Branch uh, within the division. Now, this is... Uh, the work uh, on developing a new public service agreement at this stage provides a, an invaluable opportunity to look at how the PSA going forward can better reflect the, the Minister's ambitions for public transport uh, and setting out the, the role of TransLink in that and how we can support full delivery of PFG commitments and outcomes in that regard. Now, as the name suggests, the PA, PSA and EU exit branch also leads on Brexit issues within the division. However, addressing Brexit issues in public transport cut across uh, a wide range of areas in the department. Their regulatory policy leads elsewhere, uh, legislation teams, and obviously the central Brexit team. So over the last three years, there's been very close working relationships between those teams to coordinate, very much with a focus on ensuring that in a post-Brexit scenario and following the end of the trans transition period, that from the passenger perspective, there is very little difference in terms of the ability for public transport to operate across the border. Uh, and I think that's been a fairly complex piece of work, but one I think has put the department in a very good position uh, going forward. The public transport regulation branch in the revision has responsibility for managing ser service permits for commercial operators, and that team was set up in 2017. 
Uh, since its establishment, the branch has focused heavily on redeveloping the process for bus service permits. Um, we're working quite closely with a range of stakeholders. That's included the, the Consumer Council, uh, Bus and Coach Northern Ireland, which previously was the Federation of Passenger Transport, Transing and local government. And it's all about improving that application process and addressing some of the issues which were previously identified. Um, now, I think the, in terms of the applications that come through that, in the last three months we've seen quite a lot of progress in starting to uh, clear applications for permits. Uh, I think it's approximately eight permits have been provided, and there's 25 which should be dealt with in the, in the coming weeks. Um, finally, we have the Accessible and Community Transport Branch, and that leads on concessionary fares, accessible transport and community transport. And that includes the delivery of grant funding for community transport. Now, Minister's already highlighted the, the key role that community transport plays in supporting some of the most vulnerable in our communities to access basic opportunities. And obviously, the significant challenges which constraints in the department's budget since 2015 have had on the funding of community transport. And that's also at a time when the demand for services has increased, particularly uh, for health-related journeys, which now account, I think, is 25 per cent of all community transport uh, trips going forward. And that team is also responsible for that management of the Rathlin Island ferry contract. So that's a broad overview of the, the work of the division and some of the key issues which uh, we are currently addressing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and you've addressed some of the questions I was going to ask in around the, the five year service agreement with um, TransLink, which I which it, you've, it was in the papers and you've said about it being extended. And, and obviously, will differ to a certain degree the fact that we're going to be working outside of European regulations. Is that correct? Yeah, well, there's an issue about <coughs> transposing uh, 1370 or making sure the legislation is in place for 1370 to still have effect post Brexit, and that works in hand. But obviously, you know, the, I mean, how we operate sort of in the transition period may differ then to what the new agreement will be then sort of post that that period. It would be it would be very much a sort of a decision for ministers to take, but at this stage, uh, uh, I think in the trans part of the transition period, then 1370 would be the domestic legislations would allow for 1370 to effectively apply post Brexit. Okay, and, and so during but during and obviously during this this current um, service agreement. Um, um, period, um, TransLink haven't received the budget that they yeah. have required, um, and I suppose moving forward, we need to be sort of we need to be cognizant of that, and um, obviously mindful that there's going to be um, a budget announcement in, in the next couple of weeks, and, and we're hopeful that that may um, address some of the issues. But um, you know, what was your analysis of, of the current situation for TransLink? I think in terms of the current situation, uh, Minister's clearly highlighted uh, the, the issues that, that are there. The, the fact is that since 2015, we had a removal of £13 to £15 million pound at that time in TransLink's budget through the, the removal of, I think it was a fuel duty rebate for bus. That's never, that was never restored, the TransLink's budget, so that's been a year-on-year year underfunding of the, the PSA uh, with TransLink. In addition to that, we've also had the issue of the growing pressure on concessionary fares, as it, you know, it's clearly been a very, very successful policy, but and the, the bill for concessionary fares has increased year on year. I think we're now at a stage that's effectively underfunded for Transit to a tune of £8 million this Sorry, year. Can you repeat that? Yep. I think that's effectively underfunded this year to a tune of £8 million, potentially rising to £10 million by the, the end of this year. So it's both the, the removal of the fuel duty rebate for bus and the growing concessionary affairs pressure. Now, Transinc, effectively drawn on Transinc's reserves since 2015, uh, have enabled the protection of the, the public transport network in Northern Ireland. We're now at a stage where that is not really an option going forward uh, unless additional funding is secured to, to deal with that. that. Um, I think this is one of the key issues obviously Minister is exploring with her executive colleagues is how we respond to that. Okay, within the first day brief there was also a um, reference made to the application by Han and Coach Hire for the, the link between Belfast and Londonderry um, and again that would add an additional pressure as, as stated in the paper of 2.2 million pressure on um, TransLink, are you in a position to comment on that particular issue? Unfortunately, because it's an ongoing matter within the department in considering Hannon's application, it's not something I can comment on today. Okay. Um, 
I don't know whether you have any informa further information around the concession fares with you. Um, I'm guessing committee members would be quite interested to know, really, as you, you said, that it has been a successful scheme and was added pressure to TransLink. But just in relation to the current costing of that and sort of the breakdown of that. I could provide more details. Um, um, I could give you a high level figure, but I wouldn't be absolutely 100% cer certain that's the figure. So if we're happy enough, I'll forward the information. I'll be content actually breakdown. if we got accurate information just in <coughs> yep. relation to that. Um, and just finally for me, would you be able to give us a progress report just on the Belfast and the London Dairy transport hubs? Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the London Dairy, the North West uh, transport hub. Uh, there was a soft opening in the hub, which is effectively the station building. Uh, I think that was October last year. Uh, work is advancing pretty well now on the, the external site, and I think we are on track for the full opening of the site in the autumn uh, of this year. Um, a key focus now going forward in advance of that is looking at the public transport connections into the hub, including the cross-border bus connections into the hub and the active travel uh, centre within the hub itself. On the Belfast hub, uh, work is the enabling works I understand have now commenced or due to commence very shortly. Um, and it's anticipated the opening of the site um, of the hub itself is 2024 2025, uh, I believe that is. And that's the actual hub. There's also the project itself isn't just about the hub building, it's the wider regeneration of that site through the, the Weaver's Cross. Uh, that work is at uh, an early stage uh, in development, but is a critical part of the success of the hub. I think both the North West Transport Hub and the Belfast Hub represent a, a different approach to how you take forward major public transport uh, facilities such as that, where you look at the wider benefits of those in terms of the ability to drive regeneration in an area, but also become a focal point that allow you to develop, uh, be much more ambitious in terms of the shift onto public transport. So it, it almost goes back to the point at the start in terms of it's not just about investment in transport and the key relationship with the transport plans. You need to understand why do people move in certain ways. So if we design environments which are effectively, you know, require people to travel by car, then that's what will happen. If we want people to move on to public transport and active travel, then the environments have to be designed uh, in a way that supports that. And that's not just the street infrastructure, it's also about the type of facilities you have there, the residential, the, the businesses and the leisure opportunities, etc. So it's a much different approach uh, to doing this. Yeah, I mean, the Minister's been very clear that she wants us to think about things more holistically, yeah. um, particularly to think about transport schemes and how they create places. So to focus on placemaking rather than just focusing <coughs> on, say, providing a bus station or yeah. a train station. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Chair, and thanks very much for the update. Um, just obviously, Tommy, I know you can't speak for the Minister, but I mean, I just want to go back to the issue of the commercial bus permits. Mm -hmm. I mean, the overall assessment, or maybe can you give some numbers in relation to that, or do you feel any threat underneath? Uh, I know there's there's demand and there's a need at times. Um, but I'm just wondering your overall assessment of all that, the applications. And In terms of specific applications? Yeah, and the numbers itself, yeah. Even the Minister, if you're... Oh, sorry, I didn't speak. catch that. It's slightly hard of here. Oh, no, yeah, the overall number, yeah. The overall yeah. number, yeah. Well, um... In terms of the overall number, we have, a, we have a number of applications currently which we are working through. Yeah. As I said, um, I'm happy to forward the actual details of this. I think offhand, it's approximately five to eight. Uh, determinations have gone out uh, in recent weeks. There are 25 that are in the final stages, which effectively involve us. Sorry, um, going back to operators just for further information. For example, on the accessibility of vehicles that they're planning to use, um, we would expect those to be processed very, very shortly. And obviously, we have the, the Hannans application, which I can't talk about because that's still going through the process. No, oh, and, and I mean also obviously in the context, you know. The, TransLink, they're, um, they're operating viable routes there. That, yeah. you know, it's, um, I would be more concerned about rural, the impact that would have mm -hmm. on rural. And I have no objections to anybody applying for uh, you know, a bus operation. Well, like, but I mean, just the overall impact that would be. You know, well, I think the, the key thing is the PSA covers a range of services, okay. uh, you know, including that would be those that are profit making services, such as a lot of the rural routes, and obviously the profit making services. So it's part of a package of routes. 
I think if we go back and look at what the purpose of the bus service permit was, it was to allow private operators to come in to address gaps in the market or complement transing services, potentially linking onto those. Um, and uh, you know, that's really at no, this no, stage. No, no, I appreciate that. I'm not, I'm not disputing yep. that at any point. I'm just just asking for some facts. Um, Liz, you mentioned PFG. Yeah. Under the, it's the new title, the NDNA. Now it's our new DNA, mm -hmm. but it's new deck and new approach deal. In terms of, it envisages multi-year budgets, mm. and I mean, we've, we've seen down through the years in terms of public transport on our road system, we seem to come across, we've been operating on an annual basis trying to recover mm. some, some roads and do different programs. Um, what's your view on it now in, in terms of, is that, that's what it says in the new DAC and new approach document, that's the way we're going to tackle it in the future, and the program for government will well, clearly outline that, or? Well, the budget process is ongoing. Mm. Um, I'm, I mean, obviously, we're all aware that um, annual budgets creates big problems. If you're looking at creating strategic infrastructure, mm. it's very difficult to plan purely on an annual basis. Mm. Um, it really a matter for the executive to make sure that the, um, the um, commitments in ND and A are brought forward and that we move towards um, annual budgets, so, sorry, into multi-annual budgets. Certainly it's helpful in terms of infrastructure planning. In terms of delivering the programmes, yeah. we'll see, obviously, from a committee point of view. But mm. No, no, I just want your views on that. Sure, I'll leave it to all this for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Buchanan. Thank you. Um, I think it's the heating in here. It's probably a little bit difficult to hear. Uh, I'm certainly having trouble. But anyway, a question on community transport. I don't know if I'm directing it to Tom or yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Where, where's that sitting currently financially? What's that sum of money? Um, the sum of money I, is approximately £4.5 million pound between community transport and DATS. I think it's £2.4 million pound for community transport. I think the Minister has previously set out if we, we look at the fund in uh, since 2015, it's been effectively a 20% reduction in funding, which we've tried to mitigate year on year through a year monitoring round. So you say, sorry, Tom, 2.5 or 4.5 million? It's 2.5 specifically for community transport for the dial lift, yeah. and then it's 2. Point, sorry, 2.4 for the dial lift and 2.1 for the uh, disability action transport, which is also delivered uh, outside of Belfast through the community transport partnerships. Okay. The no, question then on the economic corridor, um, you refer to no change. I'm looking at a little graph here on, on our page 75. How often has that done? Has that done about two years regarding the, the, the economic corridor and the travel times? This so is the indicator. This PFG indicator. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah um, we would normally um, we would normally um, update the data every two years. Yeah. And what do you define, Liz, as the economic corridor? How far does that reach? Um, there are, um, when now bear in mind that this is the draft PFG, so things could change with the discussions at the executive at the moment. The the, um, the corridors were um, defined in the original document in the original programme, um, and they were defined by the economists, and they looked specifically at strategic routes from the edge of um, from the edge of towns to the edge of a new town. Yeah. So it's really just looking at that corridor door from edge to edge and it, I think they used the strategic they did the the use of strategic road network effectively yeah. um, that that's the likes of your a5 your a6 your your motorways uh, and the connecting corridors the rationale behind that was to start to look at your your road networks differently they're not just about moving traffic they're effectively the networks that allow economic growth and particularly in the context of the ambitions which ministers have in terms of regional growth then you need to start looking at the impact that those corridors have in facilitating that so the new the first section of a6 has opened recently so mm. will you see a reflection on them figures based on that do you think well, given so you, you should see an end you should see if the um, if the the indicator is showing movement in the correct direction towards the outcome and the opening of the A6 was one of the things that was intended to cause a shift in that indicator, yes, you should see it feeding through. Okay, and then final question on, on I think uh, Mr Bone had sort of touched on it there on the public transport and you referred there, Tom, to enabling a, a private operators to identify gaps. Yeah. 
how do you then, you know, if a, a transit is in a gap, for example, kicks down the back of that as an example, is there then a, a can you give a private operator to do that same run if that is, you know, is that a gap? What's the definition of a gap? Well, I think if when an application comes on, then there's a range of criteria we would work through. That includes the, the individual operator applying for, yeah. for a permit to demonstrate a need or a demand in that corridor. We would take into account the impact that that would have on existing services uh, on the corridor, not just those operated by Transing, but if there's other operators that have permits for that corridor as well. Um, I think it's it's one of those areas we are continuing to engage with private operators through. Um, we established a forum quite recently with uh, the Bus and Coach NI, obviously previously the Federation of Passenger Transport. To start to explore issues, including around where the potential gaps on the network are and what the role going forward could be for private operators in the context of the Minister's direction and ambition for public transport in Northern Ireland. So, um, the, the panel, who, who's the panel make up? I don't even know specific names, but who makes up that panel? To yeah, the panel, uh, the decision making panel would be chaired by myself and two other individuals at grade five stroke grade six level within the department. Those won't necessarily be the same individuals from one but they're all department. To the other. They are. Uh, the team uh, within the division would prepare the evidence base and an assessment and then it would be for the panel to robustly test that uh, in making a determination. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. Um, the forthcoming the PSI uh, agreement and extension with TransLink. Could you run me through that process just as to how that works? Is that, is that a, an agreement that others are able to bid for, or is that straightforward? Or no, just there's give there's indication of how that works yet? There is a requirement in the legislation, obviously, for TransLink to provide the majority of public transport services, and we do that through PSA. Um, it is possible for the department to enter into PSAs with other operators. Uh, which would be different from uh, a bus service permit. It would apply to a range of, of, of services. Uh, at this stage, the department only has a PSA with Transink. Mm -hmm. But no, no other company could come in under that agreement? To well, they, they could come in under a separate PSA. But separate, but not the endangerment of yeah. Transink? But something. there is, at this stage, no other PSA, and it really would be a matter for consideration with uh, the minister and uh, that regard. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just so much going on over the next two to three years. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of work. There needs to be a firm relationship there's, between everybody to get over there the is, line. There's an awful lot of work, and I think there has been a strong recognition from the, uh, the Department, Minister, Transink, have consistently highlighted the fact that to achieve that ambition for public transport, there is a clear role for private operators. But it's understanding how that role might sit with yeah. the new PSA, and I think that's where there is an opportunity in taking forward the PSA and the continued engagement with private operators to explore that further. Okay, thank you. And just uh, further on the uh, rural transport providers and disability transport providers, uh, would you be aware how many volunteer drivers would be engaged within those networks? That is a figure previously I could have given you. Uh, at this stage, I can't uh, give you that a figure, but I'm certainly I'd be happy to follow up within the department. Okay, thank I, I do appreciate the work of volunteers, but sometimes yeah. I don't like to see volunteers abused either. You know, so uh, there's a there's a lot of work goes on. I've seen advertisements recently for volunteers and that, and just making sure people are recognised for the work that they do on a voluntary basis. So yeah, thank you. Of course. Ms. Kimmins. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for, for the update. Um, it's just a couple of questions, I suppose, from your own mind. Um, you met, under the TransLink sponsor unit, it mentions that the, the TransLink get 180 million funding, mm -hmm. um, and it was really just to get a wee bit more detail on what that funding goes towards. I know we've mentioned the, the transport hub for, in Belfast there. Um, so it's just to get a wee bit more of an idea around that. There's a, there is a range of capital projects covered by that that would be including bus procurement, uh, new rail carriages, etc. Um, the the Belfast hub, the, the big projects such as that. But there's a full mm -hmm. range of projects. I'd be happy to provide a more detailed yeah, breakdown of what that funding goes towards. 
And then there's also the revenue fund in itself, which will cover the, I think it's the PSO1 rail, uh, for example, and concessionary fares are all part of that too. But as I say, I'd be happy to provide a detailed yeah, breakdown. I think of that would be very useful. Yeah. And you mentioned there just as well, I suppose, another question around the PSO, and it's for rail. Is there any reason why it's not for buses as well? Um, in fact, the fuel duty rebate and bus was removed uh, as a result of the cuts to the department's budget in 2015. Okay. And that's, that's the only that's reason I know, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Okay, thanks, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mayor. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thanks to the officials for coming along and have already declared uh, uh, interest in terms of the fact that I was previously an employee of TransLink. Just, just a few things um, in relation to the transport plans. Um, it, it mentions within the sort of second paragraph. Um, it would also consider the resource costs for improved bus and rail services. Um, for me, when Northern Ireland is growing, more people are in you know, the housing is being built and and, and how we move people has to change. Yeah. Um, and when we're building new houses, the old approach has been that we build the houses, we put the road network in, and then people just drive to work. Yeah. And that's the job done. Well, th th you know, that, that can't continue. Uh, and one of the things is, is that in terms of providing those bus and rail services for the, the, the developments, is the cost associated mm. with that, um, because you know we're living in very constrained financial mm. uh, times. And what consideration will be considered uh, as part of these transport plans towards developer contributions uh, associated with that? The, the, transport, the transport plans are kind of developed in conjunction with the councils working on, obviously, their local development mm. plans. So the developer contribution, the, Theoretically, the system should work in that we provide the evidence base to the councils. The councils use that evidence base to look at, well, if we are zoning for housing, exam for example, in this place, does that make sense? Um, if there is a transport need, um, they should then be thinking in terms of developer contributions. Yes. We would then um, also be flagging through the transport planning process that you know there are issues here, and actually, are you absolutely sure about zoning there? You would be better zoning here just yes. in terms of transport That's provision. Yeah. Um, but. It's very much a, it's a bit of an iterative process, and if I'm honest, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to work yet because it's the first time yes. we've been through this. So we are working through this with the council, with each of the councils, to yeah. try and work out yeah. exactly how the process is going to work. And each council is doing this slightly differently yes. as well, so it may work better in some places than in others. Yeah. Um, I think the minister's been very clear about what she wants to get out of this process in terms of a far more um, integrated sustainable transport network and coming back to this idea about this has to be about making places and it has yeah. to be about livable places yeah. um, so I think the way that we would achieve that developer contribution is in that interface between ourselves and the councils um, exactly how it's going to work through I think that's going to become clearer over the next few years as we work through the process yeah that's useful I think it is going to be a, yeah. it's a new process for a lot of people mm. but I think it's important is that we're doing this and yeah. we're, we're, we're taking the right approach. The other one really around sort of sustainable travel is the transport hub up in Derry, London Derry, mm -hmm. and there's the active travel centres meant to be part of that, and I think it's yeah. great that that's going to be part of that and linking through to the Greenway and all the rest of it, just an update on the establishment of the active travel centre. Well, there's still, I mean, work's still ongoing uh, on that, very much with the aim of having the centre up and running uh, by the time we have the, the full open of the site uh, in the, the autumn. I think there's quite a few teams in the department are involved in that, uh, taking that forward. I think a key aim to the site in the, the active travel centre, one of the key objectives was obviously providing information, promoting active travel, but it was also about animating that building itself yes. because a key objective was to create this sense that it's a community facility. Um, so when we look at the design of the building, for example, it is entirely open to the public. Um, the only part that's restricted for those who are using train services is effectively the platform, access onto the platform. Uh, Transink have done an awful lot of work uh, in drawing in some activities into that area. In the meantime, while we're waiting for the, the active travel centre to open, that's included the uh, activities ranging from country markets, uh, tea dances, and for those so inclined, yoga classes. You know, so it's uh, <laughs> of a whole down series, whole down series, uh, whole down. Yeah. But it, it's uh, so it's not just about the active travel centre; it's about trying to sort of draw people and activity into the building itself. Yeah. 
Well, one other thing is just in terms of our cross-border rail link. Um, there's a commitment outlined in the decade new approach alongside many other commitments yeah. uh, in terms of feasibility studies and stuff like that. And the thing is that the sets for that are, are yeah, obviously there was a refresh done of those, but you know there's going to need to be a replacement of those. Also, the, the journey time um, from Belfast to Dublin, and on occasions you can do that quicker by car or by coach rather than by train, and there's an issue there in terms of the competition around that. Um, and also in terms of the frequency of the service, you know, in terms of bringing in an, an hourly frequency. Is there any update in terms of progress in relation to that? Yeah, well, Minister said that she will be engaging with her counterpart, obviously, in Dublin through the NSMC to look at how we take forward that feasibility yeah. study itself. I mean, it's an interesting point you've raised in terms of the journey time by by car. Uh, I think the the key, some of the key issues that need to be considered are frequency of service as well as as well as the the length of the journey yeah. itself. But there is an underlying message. I think it's fair to say, Liz has come through from the the work on the transport plans, which highlight that the investment in infrastructure, public transport infrastructure in itself, is not actually enough to drive modal yeah. shift. You do have to address wider issues, such as the priority you're attaching to bus, you know, within your urban areas. Because obviously, if we do travel by train between Belfast and Dublin, it's highly unlikely for the majority of those making the journey that the journey stops or starts in Connolly Station or Great Victoria Street. You know, so it's the connections outwards. Then, yeah. um, parking's a key issue, and always has been uh, a key issue. If the relative costs and ease of making the journey by car compared to real, including the cost and the availability of parking, are fairly attractive, then it will be very, very difficult to move people off uh, away from the cars onto public transport. And, you know, as the Minister has set out, unless we actually do that, then it will be very difficult to realise those wider ambitions in terms of economic growth for Belfast and across Northern Ireland. Yeah. I think it relates to the transport plans thing. You know, in Belfast, you know, you can have all the ambition you want, but if you can't get people in and out of the city in a sustainable fashion, it's not going to work. Yeah, I mean, one of the things the transport plans, and particularly the Belfast transport plan, is looking at is, you know, how do you make it so that travelling by sustainable means is more attractive than travelling by yeah. other means? So, how do you give journey speed, journey reliability? Um, how do you make it so that it becomes the natural choice, so it's an easier, um, it's easier to travel by sustainable means than be one person driving into Belfast in a car? And th in terms of the um, work we're doing on the transport plans, that's kind of all reflected in the evidence base. So it will be for the minister now to take what is in the evidence base and to look at how does she want to prioritise going forward in terms of, and she's already said that she believes that sustainable travel is the way forward. So we will be talking to her about ways to achieve that, ways to achieve really demand management and restraint um, or, um, other road users. Just one quick question, just around concessionary fares. Um, obviously, the, the, there was previous officials were in in terms of the constraints around that, in terms of the demand upon that. Um, but whether the view is from officials that you know, if you actually were to reduce or to curtail concessionary fares, essentially what you're doing is you're reducing funding to Translink and exacerbating the issue in terms of its own financial position. And also in relation to concessionary fares, if you look at the situation um, across the rest of you know London, for example, or other parts, where concessionary fares has been used to try to encourage more younger people potentially to use transport. Um, the concern I've got is that the half fare finishes at 16, and then sometimes the incentive then to continue to use public mm -hmm. transport is lost as a result of that. Also, half fare is offered to largely people with a disability, um, whereby in other parts of the UK that would be they would get a full fare concession and just a view in relation to that. Well, I think in relation to concessionary fares, obviously any change to concessionary fare schemes would be would really be a matter for the, the Minister, and the Minister would consider that in the context of the wider priorities in the budget available to the Department. But you know, I think what you have highlighted in terms of the benefits of concessionary fares, they, they go far beyond uh, transport you know, and, and the department. If we look at the, the over-60s, uh, which was previously the over-65, um, I think we, we can certainly see the, the uptake of public transport by that group. And you know, I, I recall my memories of grandparents, which are very, very different from what we see today in terms of people out about engaging more fully in society. 
So it's a much wider benefit contributing across PFG, and it's not just a matter, obviously, for the department. Thank you, Ms Kelly. Thanks very much. Um, can I, uh, it would be no surprise, I'm sure, uh, that I, and I hear, heard what you said, Hannon Transport is a company and neighbours of mine, so I, I, and you do know I've written to the department and facilitated meetings in the past, so I don't want to ask about that specific issue. However, I do want to know, in terms of the com commercial bus service permits, how long do those take to, to actually um, process through the department? Yeah, there was a, a delay following the, the Haddon GR where it was necessary to go back and review the process itself and put a new process in place. Um, since that process has been in place, over the last three months, we have started to see the clearance of bus service permits. A um, few issues, few learning points in terms of the consultation and the length that is taken uh, with a number of groups. Um, but as I said, we are working through the permits now, and we have started to see quite a lot of those either cleared or in the final processes of about to be cleared. And part of the engagement with the, the private operators through the forum we've established is to look at the experience and, where possible, how we can improve that experience going forward. Well, it has been a very bitter experience, I think, by many, I would have to say. The, um, the issue around the Belfast Transport Hub, hub flagship and the programme for government commitments in, in terms of uh, transport playing its part yeah. in, in a wider economy and in tourism. So, uh, are there um, opportunities for uh, commercial or you know the tour bus companies to use the stands in the, the hubs because there won't be presumably or there ought not to be a bus parked in there twenty four seven. Otherwise, it's seriously wrong. You know? I, mean, I mean, certainly in terms of the, the access to bus stations, that is something that is actively being uh, considered, and it's something we certainly you know we will be discussing with ministers as we work through the process uh, with the hub. It's actively being considered with the sorry, we can't hear you terribly no, well up no, here. Sorry. It's the, the issue around access to stations for private operators, um, that is a matter that we will be discussing uh, with the Minister as we go forward. It'd be a minister uh, be something that the Minister would have input into. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of the Belfast and Derry proposed city deals, you know, have, have there been discussions or are there any exciting prospects uh, that are on the horizon in, in relation to uh, your department's contribution to that or opportunities for the department to exploit? Well, I think certainly there are opportunities to exploit. Um, I think if we look at both city deals and the vision and ambition they set out, and in the Belfast city deal, I specifically stick in the, the Belfast area, but I recognise that goes well beyond that. Um, both city deals have at their heart uh, a vision of a, a transport network within the city which is driven by active travel and public transport. So, for example, whilst the Derry city deal does not specifically have a transport infrastructure dimension to it, uh, I think there is a recognition that realises, realisation of that ambition will require a uh, significant modal shift on to public transport and active travel in the city. In, in, in terms of the, uh, the Prime Minister's commitment to infrastructure, yeah. are there any um, discussions ongoing as to what that might mean for here in terms of the Barnet consequentials? Uh, I mean, obviously, those will be discussions uh, you know, uh, between finance and uh, Treasury colleagues uh, in relation to the Barnet consequentials uh, that will come across as part of the Northern Ireland block. But there's no, no there Certainly, at this stage, I would not be familiar with uh, it just makes it very difficult to plan, you know. But anyway, they, from your perspective, I'm sure. But the, the other uh, bit that I wanted to ask was just going back on to the 180 million that's given to uh, TransLink. Uh, that is in, a, in addition to the money, presumably, that comes from the Department of Education for the school transport. I would have to check that, Dolores. But you know, certainly, I'd be happy to confirm afterwards. I think it would be useful to know of the totalities of money uh, going to uh, TransLink. And, uh, I know you have said about how they are having to dip into their reserves, but they are substantial property holders as well, as I understand, TransLink in terms of its portfolios, the holding company. Yep. Yep. Well, we do have a briefing from TransLink. That is okay. I look a forward to that. There so will be more information, no doubt, at that meeting. Uh, Mr Beggs. <coughs> Yeah. In, in the area of transport plan, did you mention your liaison with the local councils uh, where they finalise the area plan? Uh, a key aspect of that is 
new spine road development, which will facilitate both private and public transport. My question is, how are you going to ensure that failings in the past are corrected in terms of that? Uh, and in saying that, I think in terms of um, uh, an area in Carrick Fergus, where literally thousands of houses have been built, but the key bit of the spine road isn't even uh, in an area set for development as of yet, so it won't be a development-led road. Uh, so it's, there's that for a, a bottleneck on the other routes. And thinking of, of a section of Larne West where a section of property has been orphaned and there's no development land connected with it to encourage the, the, that developer to develop it in some way. So how are we going to ensure that public transport routes can be developed along spine roads and serve the I think just start, I mean, it goes back to Liz's point about this, the, the difference this time in the approach is, is very much uh, well intended, I think it's fair to say, as a partnership with councils. It is collaborative, councils. very collaborative. Yeah as you work through the stages, so we don't have a situation where land use planning and transport planning are taken forward uh, almost separately. Um, and the need to integrate that reflects the fact that if, if development is of the wrong type or in the wrong place, it will create a certain demand for a type of transport. It leads to the type of congestion we have seen in the past uh, and you know, communities, housing developments which aren't connected. Um, and we see that quite a lot in urban areas, um, yeah. even where developments are around spine roads, where, uh, frankly, it's uh, what, hundreds, if not thousands, of houses with no social amenities in those areas, requiring uh, effectively to become almost like a dormitory area where people travel to, to, to sleep, to eat, and then they go to work, socialise outside that area itself. So I think the process itself is very much about trying to ensure that when you are taking forward the, the plans, that, that focus on prioritising access by public transport and active travel is yeah. at the heart. And, and I think that the point is, although the local development plans from a council point of view are from this point in time moving forward, the transport plans have the opportunity not just to look at development going forward, but existing development and the way that we serve existing development. So there's two sites, there's, although the council's type... Um, the council's vision is as it moves forward, we, uh, the department and the minister has an opportunity to pick up things as is, as well as moving forward. So it's kind of, kind of the transport plan will have a dual, um, uh, because it's guiding all transport investment, it will have really um, the um, need to look both at what exists along with what is likely to come on stream in terms of what's being built. And how does the public engage with the area transport plan if they're not satisfied with the draft area plan and, and that process? Okay, there's a, the whole process, um, and again, it's a new process, so we're still feeling our way through it, but there is a, there's a whole statutory process around this that will involve um, consultation by ourselves, consultation by the councils on the area plans, and then um, the PAC, the independent examinations of mm. the um, local development plans and the transport, well, firstly of the local development plan strategies um, and the transport evidence um, that's been taken taken into account and then moving on to the second stage, the actual plan policies. So there is quite a lot of framework around that, giving people the opportunity both to comment but also to challenge. Okay. Um, that, that, that's helpful. In many, many areas in my constituency, um, new area plan will not be of much value in that uh, because of uh, full capacity of the sewage system, mm. new development will not be allowed mm. unless you can provide your own private sewage system, <laughs> which is relatively mm. expensive. And yet, when I read the briefing, um, it's saying that Northern Ireland more outperformed its OPA scores in 1819 and it's in course to achieve a target of 2019-20. How can we be saying that uh, it's outperforming Northern Ireland is outperforming when? Uh, much of Northern Ireland, some 100 locations, areas, there can be no development because the sewage capacity is at development. Are we measuring the right things? Okay, it's specifically on Northern Ireland water, I'm not an NIW expert, so I'm not sure exactly what is... The, the, um, 
the targets within that um, program for government um, section are actually set by the utility regulator so I'm not entirely certain how, what they did and how they took that into account but I think the, the short answer to the question is that the minister again has made it clear that she believes that there's been substantial underinvestment in our water infrastructure over <coughs> decades um, and had said that one of the things um, that she would be talking to um, Minister Murphy about in her um, budget bilateral was investment in the water system and I think that Northern Ireland Water have made it clear that the only way that they can un unlock those development opportunities is by upgrading the sewage um, systems and that will take significant investment. If, if it's helpful Mr Riggs we're receiving a briefing next week on water and drainage okay. from the department. Just uh, then in turn back to the TransLink and, and uh, public transport which is a uh, an important aspect of um, improving our uh, environment and minimising mm. our footprint. Um, Translink have indicated they've been running at deficits the last few years. In the course of the next financial year, it will get critical, where they cannot, in other words, they cannot sustain the current situation. Um, so, what is the resource funding specifically? going towards when it goes to TransLink. We've heard about there's capital expenditure, which can uh, <coughs> bring about uh, more efficient, uh, cleaner buses and trains, etc. That's one side. So what, what, how does the fund help uh, the resource side? How, how are they subsidised? Is it just a lump sum and that's it? Uh, because I'm trying to see what will be the impact, uh, the likely, what will be the likely in impact if TransLink uh, are forced to make cuts? How do they determine how are they going to bring in about savings? Uh, because as a company, they will not be able to operate under the current uh, funding regime. Yeah, I mean, I'd be reluctant to get into details because obviously this is a, a matter which will require discussion with minister in terms of what the options are and how we might address that. But I think it's it's safe to say that the scale of the challenge this year has been set out in previous papers um, would require savings approximately the range of £20 million. Pound. That can't be delivered through piecemeal cuts here or there in services. It is at a critical stage. Will it be the rural population that will suffer? Um, or will it be little use town services? It's something I, start, I couldn't go into the detail of that. I mean, it's uh, very no. much a ministerial decision. Yeah. That. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I think we'll probably get more clarity around that next week whenever we have the department up for the briefing on the budget. That's obviously for most of many folks' minds in relation to the issues around TransLink. Um, no one else has indicated, so can I thank you very much for your time you. this morning and the briefing that you gave us to receive response to questions. And no doubt we'll be meeting again. Yep. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. Then moving on to our draft forward work programme. Um, just draw your attention to that at page 82 and just advise that the visit which we were going to make to the salt mines on the 18th of March has been moved by the 25th of March and we will be asking members just to, to give a commitment to their attendance that day um, and we'll get more information closer to the time around that. Um, we have a number of briefings next week including the budget briefing which will then advise us um, for the debate the following week. Um, briefing from Department on Water and Drainage and then also um, on Regional and Strategic Planning. Um, members, any comments to make on the forward work programme at this stage? Obviously, we do have a, a strategy day um, for the 11th of March um, and that will be at um, Dunkery Street. Okay. Members of any other business they wish to raise at this stage? Sure, just a wee update. Could we write to the department just a wee update from the minister and minister where we are now and the, the, all the MLT stuff? Because I thought there was some legal advice. To There's some report due to. Yeah, we were to yesterday. get a. Or it was an engine, the engineer's report, which was received yeah. an interim um, report on and, that. And there was other legal so. advice in terms of whether or not um, she could adopt the southern system. That's right. And, and so and she, I think she did try to address some of the questions, questions on the day, day, so we can get an update. Okay. Yeah, appreciate okay. it. So members content then, our next meeting will be at 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 19th of February, in the Senate Chamber. Members content, we shall adjourn. Great. Thank you. Signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.